Members, you're all welcome to the meeting of the Justice Committee. And, and just before I suppose we, we started the debate business, and Peter, part of the committee staff, has moved on, so we want to just express our appreciation to him uh, for his assistance over the past number of months. Um, apologies are one in from Gordon Dunn, and then we have Gemma and Sinead joining us through the Starleaf facility. And uh, ask Christine if anyone has delegated the vote. Um, thank you, Chair. The Gemma Dolan has delegated her vote to the Deputy Chairperson Linda Dillon in the event that the Starleaf connection is lost, and Gordon Dunn has delegated his vote to you as Chairman. Thank you. Um, item two, then, is the draft minutes of the meeting that were held on the 22nd of October. And if members are content that they're a true reflection of proceedings, then I will sign them accordingly. Agreed. Agreed. Matters arising. Some uh, items to cover. First item under matters arising is a response from the department in respect of the current COVID-19 situation in our prisons. Um, the department has advised that between one and twenty, between the first and the twenty-seventh of October, there's been a total of three prisoners and twenty-two operational uh, prison staff that have tested positive. However, the higher uh, rate of infection in the community is leading to more cases that are being identified amongst the staff members. Uh, within the establishments, they remain stable, safe, and morale is good. Governors have indicated that they have got the resources required to deliver the predictable and effective in house regimes, and prisoners are generally understanding of and complying with the precautionary steps that have been implemented. So it's just to update members on that. Um, item 2 is correspondence from the Bar Council in respect of the personal injury duty rate. The Bar has written in respect of this issue, um, saying that there is an urgent need to address the current rate, irrespective of the future legal framework, as it is uh, detrimental to individuals, as their cases cannot be properly resolved until action is taken on this area. The Bar notes <coughs> the Department's proposal to maintain the current rate until the new legal framework is brought in by way of an accelerated passage bill. Um, would still result in at least another year before the rate could be changed. Uh, the Bar cannot see the justification for the Department's continued failure to rectify the anomaly around the current rate in Northern Ireland compared to England and Wales and Scotland, and asks for the Committee to press the Department to change the rate in the interim before any legislation around a new legal framework. The Bar has offered to discuss this issue with the Committee if it is necessary. So, members, at this stage, I would recommend that um, we ask for a response from the, Depar the Department. Um, that we see sight of their response because the bar has written to the department on this, and we can consider that response together with the information that we've asked um, from the oral evidence session that we had with officials on the 22nd of October, and then at that point we can decide how to proceed. If members are content, we'll request a response from the department to the bar's concerns and pick it up um, when we get further information ourselves. Um, item three is just the committee forward work programme. <clears throat> There's an informal uh, discussion planned uh, around our strategic priorities, and that's taking place next Thursday. So, members, that information is there um, to note. Item four then is a response from the department um, around the committee's uh, concerns regarding the provision of information on incidents. So, the minister has responded. Uh, to the committee's request for information on the criteria that the department uses to decide when to inform it of any incidences and the proposal to develop an agreed approach or protocol advising off incidences and then important matters in a timely manner. Uh, members, the minister has advised that she doesn't consider it practical or possible to define specific criteria against which the department assesses what information to share with the committee. Um, and when. She is also of the view that it would not be possible or necessary to develop a protocol. She is, however, committed to ensuring that where practical information on developing situations is shared with the Committee in a timely way. So, members, that is the response from the Minister um, around the Committee's request in this aspect. Are members content to note it? I am not content with the substance of the response, but um, Doug, I know you had raised this last. Yeah, week. I have, Chair, and 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 I'm not content either. And the reason I'm not, I mean, we we raised this because of the death of two prisoners in custody, but there are linked issues to that. 
Um, and that is why it's important that we understand when we should or should not be informed of a critical incident that has happened, even if it is done in the same way we were informed in regards to COVID in the prisons, which I thought was very good, that we should be informed in the same way if there's something critical that happens in regards to a death in custody. For example, let's imagine, and you'll know, um, Linda, um, if there was a death in police custody, would the policing board be informed immediately? Yes, they would. Um, because they need to know. Uh, and I think we need to know, because if we join the dots of everything that went on around the death of those two prisoners, we will suddenly realise that the day before the first death, serious concerns were raised about the levels of staffing uh, on, on prisoners the day before. And the week before the first death, there was a serious incident which left one prison officer in a house on his own prison house on his own. So if you join up all the dots, there's a fundamental issue aligned with these deaths um, in, in custody. And I think if we don't know in a timely manner, um, we can't scrutinise the, the, the bigger issues here. And, I, and I've got a, a wider issue in regards to night custody officers and the level of night custody officers, which are presently sitting uh, at times 10 below where they should be. Um, so I'm, I'm really not consent, um, Chair, and, and I don't know how we, we take this forward, whether it's a case of um, not having a protocol but having an understanding, you know, maybe a memorandum of understanding that critical incidents such as death in prison um, uh, or death in custody, uh, you know, we need to be informed, uh, even if it is done um, not publicly but, but, but privately. Rachel and then I'll bring Linda in. Thanks Chair. Um, notwithstanding what Doug um, was saying, I, I, for me this brings into a, a wider issue of, of mental health and health in prisons um, and, and that's sort of so, something that I, I certainly would welcome information on in a sensitive manner um, if, if, if incidents like this does arise but we do have to obviously um, be mindful of what families of, of these people wanted and, and one I'm aware of did not want information in public but there is absolutely nothing to stop us being informed in confidence and all the members respecting that confidence and, and, and being aware of things rather than waiting for a report in a couple of years time. Linda? I think it really, I mean, Rachel has, has covered the point. I do think that it, it should be shared, but I, I do absolutely think that it should be in confidence because of the the issues that have been outlined, particularly around families and sensitivities around families, because, you know, in this committee, I think we have been very focused on every piece of, of work, whether it's around policy, font and legislation, we've been very focused on victims and those most impacted and these families at the end of the day are would fall into in some sense that, that that group of people so I do think that we have to protect them I think that we have to look after them but I do think that it could be shared with us I mean even in council for example they have you know confidential sessions and I have to say I've never known in my time in council or in, even since I've come off of any confidential business that was breached or one occasion, which it actually was a genuine accident where the member just didn't realise. So I think that things can be shared in confidence and members are not able to use that then because it, it is shared in confidence. You know, you're, you're bound by that and you can't use it in terms of press or, or anything. So I understand that there could be concerns around that, but if it's done in confidence, then any member that uses it will be in serious trouble and with it unanswerable to this committee and to the Assembly for stepping outside of that. But... I think there has to be a way of doing it because just so that we're aware of it even and that we're not blindsided and that we then can say, well, we acknowledge that was in confidence, but out of that, we would like to have a further conversation or we would like to look at this further um, because I'd, I actually would be a wee bit more cautious just because I get what, what you're saying, Doug, and I, and I don't disagree in some senses, but I don't want to conflate those two issues because... It would be wrong to do so. There hasn't been any investigation that, that has said that that's those two things related, and I just don't think we should go down that road. However, we don't know if the things two things are are linked because we haven't got enough information. So I think it is important that we get that information, but in a way that protects everybody involved. Okay. Well, like I've noted, the minister's response, you know. Uh, 
which was beyond just the prison issue. You probably <laughs> talked about critical incidents in a, in a general sense. Um, and she is saying in, in response to the committee that they do assess what issues that may generate public interest or impacting on the justice system and that's done on a case by case basis and individual merits of sharing that with us. Is, so there's obviously some kind of system. I don't know how well it's actually defined within the department as to you know, what merits being given to us as to critical type incidences or that would generate public interest, but there must be some kind of filter that goes on. The Minister thinks the best way to do that is by having a good working partnership with this committee and building on our trust and so on. And, but all of those things are good, but sometimes you need to have a very clear protocol. Now she does make, a, I think, maybe a valid point that what we've asked for, no committee has asked for. Um, you know, in terms of having a detailed protocol as to what information should come. Um, so if it doesn't exist in other committees, I think the Minister's fair enough to point that out, but that doesn't mean that it's right that it doesn't exist in other committees. Um, but I'm not clear just as to how we could rectify this if the Minister's not willing to engage with the committee to, to develop this. Does the committee need to think about asking for a protocol and these are the type of things that we want to be considered as information that we get supplied to? Death and custody being obviously a prime example of the type of information. You know, so th there could be a piece of work done to scope out what we as a committee would deem to be of a critical nature that would require a protocol um, and that we would initiate that with the department. Otherwise, we go back to the minister and say that we, we know your response. However, we still think you should engage with us. If she doesn't want to, she doesn't want to. We can't force her. Doug? Yeah, um, and, and it's an issue. If the, if the minister doesn't want to, then he doesn't want to. And, and I don't think you know a detailed protocol maybe is the right way, but just an understanding, um, certainly of something that's as serious as a death in, in, in prisons or in custody or, or, or anything like that. Um, uh, and, and the reality is we will have to revisit this whenever the, the prisoner's ombudsman brings out her report. But that could be so far down the line where we're trying to do stuff in a, in a sensible, speedy manner to, to avert issues uh, in, in the future. And I've asked the prison's uh, ombudsman if she would look at that level of, of, of um, night custody officers uh, and what part it plays within that. She doesn't have a statutory right to do that, but I believe she's going to ask for the minister to give her permission to do it, to do that. But again, we're now going to sit as a community just waiting um, uh, until that report comes out. And, and, and it's just, to me, it's not a timely manner to be able to action something, you know, um, especially when there's two deaths in 10 days. Uh, you know, it's, I think it's pretty, pretty awful, but, but you know. Paul? Yeah. First of all, I think we should state that people die in prisons, uh, not necessarily controversial, it's just life uh, in many occasions. So again, it doesn't have to be a controversial issue that primes uh, an official in the Department of Justice or any department to actually engage with the committee. Um, <coughs> what I think giving us the heads up, for want of a better word, and for informing this committee will we'll do wonders for that special relationship that the Minister yearns for. Now, if, she, if she's really serious for that, she should look at what the committee has actually functioned to do. And that is to scrutinise, but it's also there to support and advise. And really, we could never ever advise if we are not given the full picture. Uh, when we get that information, uh, confidential, confidential or otherwise, it's on us then to treat that information respectfully and responsibly. Uh, but the Minister and the Department should trust us with that. And if one of us step outside of any requirement or, or uh, agreement, then it's on us and we should take the flat for that. But we cannot do our job if we are half blind. We cannot do our job if we're not fully informed. So in order for the health of democracy in this country, I think it's right. Now, do we need a protocol? No, I don't think we do. I just think we need everybody to be open and transparent. And that should be the default. So 
I would be saying to the officials, if in doubt, tell the committee. It's as simple as that. Uh, and they will know, because they are experienced and they work in that world on a daily basis. They will know when an action is taken or a situation happens that is either severe, important, significant or abnormal. And that's the sort of stuff we need to know. We don't need to know what people do in their tea breaks. We don't need to know uh, what shift patterns there is. We just need to know as full a picture as possible in order to make informed decisions and choices and ultimately to do our work as scrutinisers. And once we do our work as scrutinisers, we will end up with a better department, a better world and a better democratic system in this country. And that's the crux of it. And if ministers are scared of that, if minister department officials are scared of the scrutiny power uh, of this committee, then they're certainly they've got the wrong end of the stick <coughs> and of the wrong idea. Because we're also here to advise and support. Okay. Well, if members are happy, we'll go back to the minister indicating that we appreciate her willingness to develop that positive relationship. Uh, the committee at all times can be trusted with confidential and sensitive information, and and would agree to deal with it on that basis where the department provides that to us. I do think we should ask um, for her to elaborate on the paragraph where she talks about the combination of factors considered when determining what information to share with the committee. I do think she should elaborate on what is that process that the department um, goes through before they release information to them and uh, say that we expect um, just that openness and transparency at all times with the department um, and constructive engagement with the committee. Members happy we go back on that basis and then we can pick it up again. Okay. Okay, then the next item is the um, Criminal Justice Committal Reform Bill. Um, obviously, members will know that that was introduced on Tuesday. So, officials are attending the meeting today via the Starley facility to brief the committee on the principles of the bill. So, the relevant um, papers, including the, the bill and explanatory memorandum, are available for members, uh, pages 45 to 107. And there's a copy of PowerPoint slides that officials are going to refer to during the presentation. They are on pages 8 to 16 of your tabled pack if you want to access those members. So hopefully at this stage um, I'm able to go to the castle buildings there and welcome formally then Glenn Capper, head of the Justice Performance Team, Access to Justice Di Directorate and Laura Mallon uh, from the Justice Performance Team. Uh, all from the Department of Justice and there may be a few more there that I can see in the picture that I haven't maybe mentioned. So this session folks will be recorded by Hansard and then that will be published on the, the committee webpage. So I think um, Lynn I'm handing over to you at this stage. Thank you Chair. I'll just check you can hear me okay? We can yes we can hear you clearly thank you. Excellent thank you. Um, I've got a picture on screen that is four people, all of whom are motionless at the minute, but I can assure you it's just Laura and I in the room at the minute. So I'm not sure what you can see. Yes, absolutely. Statues. We have the same image of four people, but <laughs> so that's okay. That, that explains why I thought that there was maybe more than just the two of you. But we can hear you, so okay. that's okay. You feel free to we'll, uh, we'll just get somebody at this end to, to see if we can get the video running. But if I maybe start with my opening comments while we're doing that. Yes. No problem. Okay. Well, firstly, thank you. Uh, it, it's good to be with the committee this afternoon, uh, and thanks for the opportunity to brief the committee on the Criminal Justice uh, Committal Reform Bill. It's important to say at the outset that the principles and policies around reforming the committal process are not new. Powers to, powers to directly commit cases to the Crown Court are included in the Justice Act 2015 and reforms to the committal process were considered in detail as part of that bill. The goal to be the number of external reports and reviews recommending committal reform, and I'll touch on some of those later. And reforming the committal process is a key part of the department's plans to speed up the justice system and improve the experience of victims and witnesses. So why the committal reform bill? Uh, 
This is a short type of focus build designed to do three key things. Firstly, through the Justice Act 2015, we previously sought to remove the need for victims and witnesses to have to give oral evidence at the committal hearing in the Magistrates Court and then again at the Crown Court. The experience of giving oral evidence that's sometimes traumatic, particularly under cross-examination, can, can have a significant impact on victims and witnesses. But this proposal did not receive sufficient support during the passage of the bill. Uh, the subsequent Fresh Start Agreement, however, recommended that oral evidence pre-Crown pre Court trial should be removed, and this bill delivers that commitment. Secondly, the bill seeks to get cases more cases more quickly to the Crown Court. The Justice Act of 2015 only provided for murder and manslaughter cases to be directly committed or transferred to the Crown Court, but this bill will expand the range of offences that will be included as part of this first phase rollout of direct committal. Finally, the bill deals with some technical issues to smooth the direct committal process. Whilst the principles of the bill are generally straightforward, some of the technicalities are quite complex. So if the committee's content, I'll work through some slides that outline the purposes of the bill with some pictures and charts that hopefully makes things more understandable. And with thanks to Christine, uh, you should either have a paper copy of the slides or have them on screen. And as we work through them, Laura and I are happy to answer any questions you have or to take questions at the end. So if you're content at that stage, we maybe move to the PowerPoint slides you have, Chair? Yes, that's fine. We have them here. Okay, I'm just to let you know, we're hoping that somebody's going to uh, sort the, the picture out, but as long as the sound's okay and you're content, we'll keep going. Yes, we can hear you, so that's okay. Okay, so if we turn to the slide pack, and if you, if you move to the first slide, which is entitled Crown Court Committal Process, um, what this slide does is set out the current cases, uh, the, the current process for all cases that end up in the Crown Court. So just to quickly work through that, there's a Magistrates Court initial hearing, and then all offences move to the Magistrates Court for a committal hearing, before then going to the Crown Court for the Crown Court trial. That slide also sets out the stages where evidence is provided. So at the Magistrates Court committal hearing, you'll see that there are three stages where evidence can be given, or evidence can be given in three ways. Firstly, a preliminary inquiry, called a PE, which is written evidence. Then a preliminary investigation, called a PI, which is oral evidence. And then a mixed committal, which is oral and written evidence. Um, so essentially, when we talk about reforming the committal process, we're mainly talking about two things. Firstly, direct committal, which is transferring cases directly to the Crown Court without that magistrate's court hearing, the committal hearing. And secondly, minimizing the impact on, on victims and witnesses so they only have to give oral evidence once at the Crown Court. So when we talk about reforming the committal process, it's essentially those two things. If I turn to the next slide, which is titled External Recommendations, uh, there have been a range of external recommendations and bodies that have supported these reforms. Uh, so just to work through those, in 2016, uh, the Fresh Start panel recommended removing oral evidence before trial and abolishing committal proceedings in terrorist offences, um, etc. In 2018, in its Speeding Up Justice report, the Audit Office said we should develop a timetable for completely eradicating the committal process. In 2018, Criminal Justice Inspection recommended uh, that rape, serious sexual offences and child abuse offences should be added to the list of offences to be directly committed. That was supported by the Gillen Review last year. And then at the beginning of 2020, the New Decade, New Approach deal uh, noted that the executive will deliver a committal reform. So a range of recommendations supporting uh, committal reform. If I turn to the slide head of direct committal, this just gives slightly more detail on how the direct committal process will work. So again, you'll see at the, the top row there, the current flow of cases that we've talked about. Underneath that is how direct committal will work. So essentially after a, 
a one-off initial hearing in the magistrate's court, all relevant offences will move directly to the Crown Court. That is, they'll be directly committed to the Crown Court. The 2015 Justice Act provided that murder and manslaughter cases would be directly committed, and you could also add some specified offences by way of order. However, this bill will expand the offences that will be directly committed, and the list of offences will be those that, in the case of an adult, are triable only on indictment. So essentially, indictable only offences, and that will include terrorism-related and serious sexual offences in line with those external recommendations. That list of offences will apply to both adult and youth cases, and the bill also allows us to add some additional cases in future by way of an order. If we then move to the next slide, titled Oral Evidence, this deals with the issue of oral evidence in a wee bit more detail. Again, we've tried to map out under both the current process and the direct committal process where oral evidence is currently given and what difference the bill will make. So in the current process, at the magistrate's court hearing, the bill will retain written evidence through that preliminary inquiry, but it will remove oral evidence through the preliminary investigation and mixed committal, and as I've said, therefore just leaving oral evidence once at the Crown Court trial. I've also noted under the Crown Court box there's a process called no bill, and that includes just written evidence, so it won't change. Under the direct committal route, as we develop plans to roll out direct committal, we identified that the Justice Act 2015 includes a process called application to dismiss. So before Crown Court trial, an application to dismiss can be kicked in from the point where the case is committed to the Crown Court up to an arraignment hearing, and that can include oral and written evidence. And had we left that as is, cases going through the current route would only have to give oral evidence once, but cases in the direct committal route could potentially have had oral evidence twice in the application to dismiss process and then again at the Crown Court trial. So the committal reform bill will remove oral evidence in that application to dismiss process, and hopefully that makes sense the way we've described it. If I move on to the next slide, which is titled Operational Outworkings 1, the committal reform bill will introduce a new process in the Crown Court whereby the Public Prosecution Service can discontinue a case from when it's committed to the Crown Court to when an indictment is presented. That's similar to processes that the Crown Prosecution Service have in England and Wales, and that's deemed a necessary process by PPS with a smooth operation of direct committal. And then on the next slide, which is titled Operational Outworkings 2, if you can bear with me, this might get a wee bit technical, but I'll try my best to take you through it. I've said that we would have two routes to the Crown Court, the current route at the top, and then the middle, the direct committal route, where relevant offences would be directly committed to the Crown Court. The Justice Act in 2015 also included a third route to the Crown Court, and that was in an area called Section 10, and Section 10 provided that if a defendant indicated an intention to plead guilty, regardless of the offence type, so regardless if it was one of those murder-manslaughter cases, then that offence would also be remitted directly to the Crown Court. However, Section 10 also included a provision that if the defendant subsequently decided not to plead guilty, they would be returned to the Magistrates' Court, and that's that dashed red line that you see in your slide. Now, having spent a lot of time working with criminal justice organisations through that Section 10 process, the bill will seek to repeal Section 10, and that's for a number of reasons. It presents significant operational complexities and risks, including the risk of false release or imprisonment. It's also an interim measure, and once direct committal applies 
to all offence types, Section 10 would be obsolete. So we would have spent a lot of time and resources implementing something that would uh, be short term. Although it's not possible to quantify with any certainty, Section 10 would also apply to a relatively small number of cases. Uh, and for a host of other reasons, we, we've decided uh, in the bill to seek to repeal Section 10 and instead focus our efforts on a more expansive rollout that provides a better and less complex basis on which to implement the changes. So through what we've proposed, we think we will get more cases to the Crown Court more quickly, regardless of an intention to plead guilty. But we do recognise the benefits uh, to victims and witnesses of fast-tracking cases where an accused wants to plead guilty. So the bill also includes powers to allow the magistrate's court to order the necessary, re necessary reports in advance of a crime court trial. And then to move to the second last slide, which is headed Committee Reform Bill. Just to sum up, at what the bill is therefore designed to do. Firstly, it will expand direct committal to the Crown Court for additional what are called relevant offences over and above those in the 2015 Act. So as I've said, we get more cases more quickly to the Crown Court in line with those external recommendations. The bill will also seek to abolish oral evidence before the Crown Court trial, both at the traditional committal hearing and also in that application to dismiss process that we talked about. And thirdly, the bill will improve the operational outworkings of direct committal. Just to give you a sense of next steps, so we're, we're discussing the committal reform bill today. Um, hopefully when that makes its way through the assembly, we'll be able to abolish oral evidence pre-trial relatively quickly. That simply requires some rule changes. In terms of implementing direct committal, um, we've established a committal reform programme with key criminal justice organisations, PPS, Office of the Lord Chief Justice, police, prisons, courts, for example. And we've also invited the Law Society and Bar Council to sit on a stakeholder forum. That programme is four projects dealing with the legislation, the IT changes, the legal aid implications and the business change required. And we hope to implement direct committal uh, in the autumn of 2022. Hopefully that's been a useful overview of the bill um, and hopefully uh, the way we've described it makes it understandable and Laura and I are happy to take any questions the committee has. Okay, thank you Glenn and that, that was helpful and uh, the slides were particularly helpful um, for me to follow so I appreciate that. Um, in terms of some of the, the areas just to have a, a discussion about that um, I'll have a few specific points, but in general, I suppose the argument that some, have made, some will make is that having an oral hearing flushes out issues rather than just <coughs> doing it by writing. And there's only so much that you can ever convey through a piece of paper. Uh, better to have somebody in front of you. Do you want to just address that initial general point in the first instance? Yeah, thank you. I'll just check. Is the video sort of out, sir? No, no, it's not. We just... You're fortunate that the, the, the frozen one is a sensible picture. You are lucky you weren't. Okay. <laughs> but no, um, we can't see you yet. If, if you want to think we can log off and log on again, are you happy just no, to do the, the... No, listen, you continue. The, 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 picture. the audio is, is 100%, so we'll just continue. Okay, we'll keep going then. Yeah. Um, yeah, to, to deal with the question, Chair, um, I, I'm, I'm sure members will be aware uh, through the process of the 2015 Act, um, this is an issue that came up. As you know, the department sought to uh, abolish oral evidence entirely before committal, um, and that didn't make its way through the assembly. Um, I suppose there's a range of arguments there, um, but if we simply look at the external recommendations uh, that we're seeking to implement, uh, ranging from the fresh start panel uh, through to uh, what other inspection bodies have said, um, I, I think it's also clear that although some of the numbers may be small that we're talking about, what we're really conscious of is the impact, as I mentioned, on victims and witnesses of having to give that sometimes traumatic evidence uh, more than once, um, sometimes under cross-examination. 
so yeah, there, there are arguments on both sides, but um, the, the department's policy position and the external recommendations point us towards seeking to remove oral evidence pre-trial. Um, and there's no provision in the bill for any extraordinary measures where it does have an oral rather than just a written, that, would, that, that right will be removed completely? Yeah, the bill seeks to remove um, oral evidence altogether pre-trial. Um, in terms of then the the number of cases or offences under the directly committed route, is there any indication of the kind of volume and numbers of cases that that would apply to? Yeah, I, I'm going to let Laura deal with some of the numbers, Chair. I suppose just as a bit of context, I, I mentioned that the 2015 Act included murder and manslaughter cases as those which would be directly committed. Um, that's a relatively small uh, number of cases, and we also wanted to try and address the recommendations about um, terrorism and serious sexual offences. Um, this is, in essence, the first rollout of direct committal. So in deciding what cases to include in this rollout, um, we were conscious that we needed to strike a balance. We wanted to get enough cases to make that rollout meaningful and to be able to get enough information for evaluating how we do subsequent steps. Um, but we also didn't want too big a number as to swamp the system because this one would have, have a significant um, impact on the justice system uh, and on the Crown Court. So we sought to strike that balance. And I'll let Laura say something more about the number of cases that indictable only offences relates to. Um, yeah, just a, I suppose a bit of background information as well on um, PAs, PIs and mixed committals, just to put it in context a bit. Um, over um, a year, um, there will be thousands, a few thousand cases going through um, this process. Um, in recent years, that's fallen to around 1,500 mark. Um, of those cases, only about 4% of them will ever go through a PI or mixed committal, so we're talking small numbers. By 82 people, I think was it the 2018 figure. Um, so by and large, these cases progress by way of written evidence. Um, uh, in terms of the numbers of cases going through under direct committal, um, the department's intention is to fully roll out eventually direct committal to all cases to go to the Crown Court at the minute. The offences that we've selected um, to go in the first tranche would be about 30% of cases that will be um, committed in an annual basis. Um, so that will give us a large enough number to see how um, direct committal works in practice um, and takes a, a, a good chunk of um, cases directly from magistrates to Crown. And thank you, Laura. And is, there, is there a time frame for when that 30% escalates to the 100%? Um, well, all of us, uh, Chair, have said that we should develop a timetable for uh, fully implementing direct committal. Um, we want to do that as quickly as possible. We also want to learn from the, the first phase rollout in terms of understanding the, the, the rebalancing of resources and so on. So over the next few months, we'll be developing a timeline uh, I suppose I would say that would be subject to our learning from the, the first phase rollout. But having developed the bill, we're now turning our attention through the programme board to looking at that rollout timeline. Okay. And what, what are the offences that is going to be in that initial phase? Okay. They're described technically as, uh, and I'm just turning to the right page so we'll give you the right definition. Um, those that in the case of an adult are triable only on indictment. Um, and I'll let Laura describe that in a bit more detail. Um, it, it's a, probably a bit of a confusing title, but um, it is actually um, a title that it, it will be well recognised and understood. The terminology refers to adults in that there is legislation that means that for youth cases, um, the only offence um, for a youth case um, that is triable only on indictment um, are homicide offences. So we didn't want to disadvantage youth cases um, and we wanted to ensure that all cases that could go to Crown Court um, are, um, are sent. Um, 
So that is the terminology then that all cases that as an adult would be triable on indictment. This includes a range of offences. So you have your homicide ones, your murder, manslaughter, all those sorts of things. You also have a range of sexual offences, um, serious sexual offences like rape. And you also have other offences like um, serious GBH and different things like that linked to terrorists and some ter specific terrorist related offences. We can provide a list um, if that would be useful. It's a rather long list and that's why it's not sort of printed out in your packs today. But it is a range of the most serious offences that can only be tried in Crown Court. There's no decisions to be made as to where they will be tried. Okay, that, that would be helpful. And then finally for me just then, um, how, how much will this speed up the process of uh, these cases and what has been the assessment around the financial costs associated with this change? Okay, um, I'll start off with that one, Chair. Um, it, it's a difficult question. How long will it save off the, uh, the, the length of time for cases to go through? There's no doubt uh, from the department's understanding and that of uh, those inspection bodies that I've talked about, the direct committal will definitely reduce the time taken for a case to progress through uh, to the Crown Court. Um, if you think about it, we're, we're taking out um, that sometimes lengthy magistrate's committal hearing. Having said that, the Crown Court um, hearing will probably and no doubt be slightly longer. Um, the length of time depends on the case. Um, we've looked at cases going through to the Crown Court through the summons route and through the charge route, and the length of time for both of those will be different. Um, but it's difficult to give a figure of X amount of days or weeks that will be saved. Okay. And in terms of finances, in, in, yeah, in terms of the finances, um, again, we come back to the point that um, this is in effect a rebalancing of resources. Um, this is still the same case going through to the Crown Court. So we will have different um, expenditure and resources required in the Crown Court compared to the Magistrates Court. That's one of the things that we want to learn as well from our evaluation of this first phase. Um, we are developing and we're, we're using some data from previous cases at the minute to uh, explore and extrapolate the impact that this will have on the two respective court tiers the Magistrates Court and the Crown Court, and we hope to model that into how it will change the balance of resources between the two courts. We don't expect it to cost any more overall, uh, but it's going to be about the rebalancing. Um, and I should say as well that I mentioned we, we've got a legal aid project as part of overall programme. Um, that will consider the legal aid implications for direct committal uh, and our legal aid colleagues in the department uh, are working on that project and we'll be doing some uh, targeted consultation next year with the legal profession to develop those legal aid implications and, uh, and fee structures. Okay. I'll open it up to members at this stage that want to ask questions. I had, a que had two questions there at the end, but actually Glenn answered them to be fair in, in his response to your questions because I, I was wondering around the legal aid implications and whether there would be savings as well as costs, which is, is the rebalance and stuff. Um, just to say thank you for the slides because it certainly is helpful in, in helping us to understand the, the process. Thank you. Okay, thanks Linda. Paul, thank you. Paul Fruit. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for your presentation and the slides. They are very, very useful. Um, a couple of questions I have, uh, and this might be set in train uh, with regards to other procedures in the judicial system, not least developed co uh, courts, but how do you define a terrorist, or is it more the terrorist offence? Because it strikes me that you may well have terrorists who are involved in other crime, and because they just happen to be a terrorist, that's what gives the frightening impact to the witness. I, th I think that the simple answer to that one is that we're dealing with the, the offence definitions here. Um, I think it, you're right. It, it's a very complex area. And if in response to fresh start recommendations, if we simply went 
for um, terrorist related offence, it would be quite a narrow group and, and obviously defined by the various terrorist pieces of legislation. We know from um, our work with um, colleagues uh, within the department who are, are more used to this area that, and through our work on in the indictable cases process as well, that um, offences that are related to terrorists are, are broad and wide and can cover things like um, uh, violent offences, um, theft offences, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that was why, um, as well, when we were selecting the offences to go through, that yes, we wanted to make sure that um, we had sufficient numbers um, of offences to move on, but we were looking at a broad spectrum. So it is those violent offences, terrorist offences as well, um, that we're including in the, the first tranche. So, so, so just to be sure, violence is because because according to your page, not, according to your page ten your the, the external recommendations slide uh, I can understand why you would have uh, terrorist offences and offences which tend to be committed by organised crime groups I can understand why you would have rape serious sexual offences and child abuse offences I probably would add to that that we probably need to make sure that we future proof this to include domestic violence and stalking. Uh, in, the, in the near future, uh, but but you're telling me it covers all forms of violence. It, it covers um, all um, violent offences that are triable only on indictment at this precise moment in time. In terms of future proofing, um, we shied away from putting a list of offences into the bill um, because that obviously is very restrictive, and the terminology used should cover future offences. We also have a. Uh, a clause within the bill that allows us to add on additional offences um, should we need to, so um, by way of order. Um, so, for example, if the domestic violence offence or stalking offences um, were um, what is termed as a hybrid offence in that it could be tried on indictment or summary, we could potentially add those on so that they are included. Yeah, I asked that question, I don't even realise or know in my head whether they are both. Um, I'm sure they are. Am I right in saying that, that they, at the minute, at, at, as presently with the domestic violence bill as it is, is there a route to Crown Court in that? Yeah, if, if we can tell, can we check that with our domestic violence colleagues and we, we'll come back to you on that one yeah, in writing? I have it in front of me actually, but I'm just, I'm, yeah. I'm speaking without thinking and that's always a dangerous thing to do. Yeah, um, just in case we give you the wrong answer, we'll ch we check with colleagues and come back to you if that's okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then our question then, whilst you were removing, you are removing this, uh, you are removing the, the need for oral evidence, or PA, at the Magistrates Court, uh, does this stop, uh, or do, do judges have the power to ask and request for oral evidence? Um, no, the, the, the bill plans to remove oral evidence um, pre-trial, um, so there, there would be no oral evidence at the committal hearing. Okay, and then with regards to the repeal uh, of Justice Act NA uh, 2015, your section 10, <coughs> uh, just looking yeah. at the schedule of, of repeals and amendments, uh, it's maybe just the way it's written, but when I look at the schedule on the blue pages, it doesn't actually mention section 10, it mentions chapter 1 of part 2, and uh, a various, uh, there's three other sections so, and schedules, so I take it that section 10 is, is incorporated within chapter 1 of part 2? Um, yeah, it, it, is, it is there. Um, I'll, just, I'll just... We're just turning the pages ourselves just to find the right reference. Uh, page um, 9 of the you, blue bill. Yeah. Um, it, it's under um, point 15, schedule, section 4, 3 and 10 are repealed. Um, oh, sorry, that's the wrong bit. It is in there. I, I can assure you it's there, but yeah. Um, so it, it must well, um, section 10 must well fit into one of those four sections, but... Then I suppose the question is asked then, is, is, there, is, is there a wider repeal? Is there something else that is repealed alongside Section 10? 
the sec section 10 was one of the more complex areas that is repeated. So I wanted to specifically highlight that in the presentation. As, as the bill points out, there are some other um, minor areas that are amended and repealed, and they're presented in the, the bill. Um, in the papers you have, there's a, a, a run through each clause, and that provides some more detail. Uh, but if, if a paper on the details of exactly what's being repealed is helpful, we'll certainly send that through. Okay. Uh, and again, so going forward, and I suppose it's the future proofing of this and the how the mechanics of legislation. So if you are going to create a new offence in the future and you believe that it should be uh, direct committal, do you put that in the face of the new bill or do you amend this <coughs> bill, Criminal Justice Committal Reform Bill? From speaking with the Office of Legislative Counsel, um, as we move to totally eradicate uh, the committal process in future tranches, and let's say it's two or three future tranches after this bill, that will require future legislation. Um, so we will require legislation as we seek to remove, I suppose, big tranches of, of offences from the committal process. However, as Laura has said, in the interim, if there are small numbers of quite specific offences that we want to remove, the bill is drafted, gives us the provision to do that by way of order. Right. So although big tranches will require subsequent legislation for specific things that we would like to remove as they emerge or become more relevant, those can be added to the direct committal process by way of order. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. I, I'm just looking at the bill. I think you're in clause four, subsection four, and it talks about that on page two. Uh, what, what is the assembly procedure then in terms of the order? Is that going to be regulation? Is it whenever you say you're going to do it by way of an order, what, what exactly is going to be the legal instrument and how will that interface with the assembly's procedure? Okay, so sorry, just to clarify, what I'm saying is, so hopefully all being well, this bill uh, proceeds and goes through the Assembly. Following that, if we wanted future one-off um, offences added, that would be done by way of order. So it wouldn't require primary legislation. Yes, so the, the Department will make an order to that effect. Um, well, does that require any stage Assembly approval? No. It's secondary legislation secondary that we would bring through that, that we would we would certainly share with the committee. Okay, listen, we can. Uh, I know we're now getting into the technical outworkings of this beyond the principles of it, so that's something I'm sure we'll we'll look at at the committee stage. Um, members, any other questions? Members wanted to raise at this stage. Um, can I can I just ask Lynn finally? Um, see, in terms of repealing section ten. Um, the, the, the Section 10 process of the Justice Act 2015. Yes, Chair. Um, in terms of those operational risks, I know you mentioned at the start, I think you mentioned um, there were some risks associated with that. Can, can you just elaborate on that again for me and any interface with victims and witnesses as to that decision, because I know that was something that they may have been keen for, which is why it was in the, the Justice Act 2015. Yes, yeah, certainly, Chair. Um, and and it's, it's true to say that um, many hours have been spent um, back in the Department discussing Section 10 and its outworkings. Um, so just to give a bit of context, I suppose if we look at the 2015 Act, Section 10 sits aside um, a provision that says only murder manslaughter cases will be directly committed. So you've got a very small number of cases being directly committed. And then the Section 10 process, it says, if somebody indicates an intention to plead guilty, they will go straight to the Crown Court. One of the key bits in that that gives us the problem is that if that person then changes their mind, then they would go back to the Magistrates Court. And that notion of somebody sort of going forwards and then backwards in the criminal justice system is a really complex thing. We have a system that it's a, that's designed to move somebody from left to right through the system. 
And once people start to go back, the operational complexities of that, the IT complexities, produce a number of risks, including, as I mentioned, the risk of false release or imprisonment. So as you um, put somebody, if they change their mind and go back to the magistrate's court, at that point, um, there are legal complexities that mean there's the risk that um, bail is applied wrongly and that person is released with the obvious impact on, on victims and witnesses. I suppose from the other angle, um, the, the very good intention of Section 10 was to put more cases more quickly to the Crime Court where there was an indication of a guilty plea. Although we don't record that, um, anecdotal evidence says that the actual number of cases that that would apply to is actually very small because it's not a guilty plea, it's an indication at an early stage to plead guilty. Um, and you could be talking a, a couple of handful of cases every year. So taking into account all of those things, and also let's remember that on the basis, our ultimate intention is to eradicate the committal hearing at the magistrate's court. So there would be no magistrate's court to go back to in section 10. So all that effort and risk of section 10 would become redundant whenever we remove the traditional committal hearing. So taking those things into account, um, we think it is better to go for a more expanded first phase rollout, as in more cases being directly committed in legislation, and therefore not have section 10. Granted, we lose some benefit because people who indicate an intention to plead guilty wouldn't be directly committed. However, it's important to remember that we have more cases going through the direct committal route now. So in some ways, whether or not they indicate an intention to plead guilty or not in those cases is irrelevant because they'll be directly committed anyway. Um, and also, as I mentioned, recognising the importance of moving early guilty pleas more quickly through the system. We have included in the bill powers where an individual indicates an, intent, an intention to plead guilty to allow the magistrate's court to get a lot of that preparatory work done for the crime court earlier. So that should also expedite the case. So uh, that's a lengthy answer, Chair, and hopefully answer some of your question. Yeah, no, that was helpful. Um, Paul's just asking just, just for, for a quick clarification. Chair, just for clarification, yes, the penalty for the offence for domestic abuse uh, offence is summary conviction and conviction on indictment. So I don't know why I even queried that, but it's there. Okay, well, I don't think anyone else at this stage, Glenn, has any questions, so I've no doubt we'll see plenty of you when we get up to the, the committee stage of this particular bill. So can I thank you and Laura sure. for the time, unless you've anything else you need um, to, to tell us? Just to add, in answer to Paul Frew's question, section 10, section 10 is repeated at the bottom of page 2 of the blue booklet. It, it, it's literally one line. That's all it takes. Okay, listen, thank you. Um, I appreciate your time. <coughs> yeah. Um, Glenn, if you're still there, I know that we're having another session with your folks, um, and it might be timely at this stage if it was dialed out and they dialed back in again while you're doing the clean down of the room and so on, just so we can see the, the visuals of the next group, if that's, that can be accommodated. Yeah. We we'll do that, sure. I think I, I'm, I'm staying off the next bit, so I, I'll try and do that now. And we'll, uh, we'll see you shortly. Great. Well, listen, we, we will. We're moving straight into the next session, so as soon as you are ready, we're, we will take our ease for a few minutes and then we'll get going again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, so the, the, the next element of the, the committee meeting is around the, the budget aspect of it, so there's. Folks are going to get that together. So, members, at this stage, um, we content as a committee that we'll support the principles of this bill, um, and that'll allow it to get into the next stage. And then, obviously, the committee will interrogate it and scrutinise it and so on. So, if you're content, then we can indicate our support um, for the principles of the bill. Uh, the provisional order paper from Monday, the 16th of November, is whenever the second stage is due to take place, and I'll. Uh, give the view that the committee is content for it to proceed into the committee stage then at that sitting of the assembly. So the next item then is the um, future year's budget. Um, 
and uh, we will take our ease. We need to suspend, so we we'll just are hoping that folks down at the castle are currently organising themselves appropriately. Do we know if they reconnected? Members, see while we're waiting, because I don't know if they're going to be connected or not. I'm going to jump to agenda item seven, the carriage of explosives, and maybe just when when we know they're ready to start again, someone can let me know and I'll go back to them. Show up on the screen when they're in the. Okay. Just they should show up on that they're getting to be called. Okay. There is so up on the screen here, Christine. There, there is something in the audience there, but um, I'm not sure if the, bro the broadcast on folks are listening. Okay, sorry about that, folks. And then let's go back. Um, yes, thank you. Um, yes. Okay, Deborah, we're getting ready to, to start this session with Fuse folks, a fuser set up and ready to go. Yes, um, I apologize, I'm not sure how we lost the picture in the last session, but the single to get it back, so excellent. Yes, Thank working. you. It's working now. Okay, so just just for members' benefits then. Um, Members want to refer to pages 109 to 135, and they and there's pages 109 to 111 also have some questions that members might want to ask around the finance aspect of it. So the department's response to issues raised during the oral briefing on the department's October monitoring position at our meeting on the 1st of October is also in your tabled pack. Um, within that, the department has advised that while the situation is fluid. No additional costs have been identified in respect of EU exit in addition to those relating to the Northern Ireland Protocol. So for the purposes of this meeting then, um, I'm going to welcome Deborah. And maybe Deborah, um, I know all the folks sitting there, but if you want to introduce your, your team that is around you, it'll save me doing it. Um, so I'll hand over to you at this stage. Welcome. Once you've introduced your team, you can make a start. Thank you, Chair. So good afternoon um, and thank you to the committee for this opportunity and um, to provide you um, a briefing on our return to the Department of Finance on the Budget 21 to 24 information gathering exercise. So this afternoon um, I'm joined by Ronnie Armour, Director of Reducing Offending Directorate, Julie Harrison, Director of Safer Communities Directorate and Glyn Capper representing Anthony Harbison from Access to Justice Directorate. So when we were last at the committee in October, we had just submitted our response to the Department of Finance information gathering exercise following an early discussion with the Minister. Since then, we have continued to refine what was presented by spending areas and today, we would like to outline the key aspects of that response and take your views. In order to facilitate the discussion, we provided written briefing in advance to give the committee the opportunity to identify the areas that they want to explore further. You will recognise from the information that we've provided that it covers a wide range of areas both within the department and across its agencies and NDPBs. On that basis, we thought it would be most useful for the committee to have the opportunity to discuss any issues outlined with those who are responsible for those areas. In terms of setting the next budget, when the exercise was first commissioned from the Department of Finance, it was anticipated that the budget would cover the period 21 to 24 in resource terms and a further year to 25 in capital. However, what we now know is that the Chancellor has announced that there was going to be um, a one-year budget given the challenges around COVID-19. 
what we all know of course is that one year budgets are not helpful for the medium to longer term planning and this development is not ideal however given the wider uncertainty over the medium to longer term funding position it's not unexpected in recognizing the challenges of one year budgets in setting last year's budget the department started more medium to longer term planning which has helped this process in helping us to understand the needs across the department we hope that the written briefing provided to you and the discussion that we will have today will provide you with a good overview of the position going into next year provide the context around it and provide further detail underpinning it to help inform your views to feed into the ongoing process what we just discussed today is by no means our settled position but i would hope that it provides the committee with the areas where there are challenges in terms of financial pressures and also areas in which we would be keen to invest in line with the minister's priorities and of course subject to funding before we open up to questions i'd like to provide a brief overview of the response to the department of finance the response asks for details of pressures faced by the department a summary of these has been included in your pack for consideration given the context of the budget is now a one year i will focus on the 21 22 figures you'll recognize that across the range of spending areas there is a significant list of pressures and we have tried to categorize these for ease of discussion looking at resource dial pressures the department faces in the region of 56 million of inescapable pressures 21 million of which relates to pay and price a significant element of what we do is serviced by people the key elements of which sit in the psni and the northern ireland prison service as you will see from your pack indeed as a whole pay accounts for 70 percent of the departmental budget and therefore this places ongoing pressures each year 15 million of inescapable pressures relate to the psni across a range of areas including estates security body armor and uniform there are 19 million of other pressures across the justice family some of the key elements include court staffing and modernization legal aid and other staff pressures you will note from your pack that these are the pressures that we deem are inescapable and therefore we need this funding just to stand still we have categorized the remaining bids under broad headings to help provide the background to the figures what drives the costs some areas of uncertainty and the need for additional funding firstly there are areas which we would anticipate dof would fund given their significance these are implications of covid 19 eu exit and legacy inquests we have provided the best estimates of the figures at this time but you will appreciate these will continue to be refined as the position becomes clearer significant additional funding has been essential this year in these areas and the expectation is that this would need to continue as we, they simply could not be absorbed the next section of bids relates to transformation and ndna the most significant element of this relates to the psni strategic outline cases in relation to an increase in police office numbers to seven and a half thousand and an investment in digital it since the committee received the written briefing dof has approved these cases this approval will therefore allow the psni to proceed the development of individual outline business cases it is important to distinguish between the types of business cases to avoid any confusion the strategic outline case or SOC, as you will hear us refer to should be a relatively brief introduction to the project concept which contains enough detail to support an informed decision on whether to proceed to the next stage which is an outline business case or an obc it is this next stage the obc where a more detailed analysis is undertaken and options considered in order to robustly determine a preferred option the obc is where the expenditure implications of that preferred option become clear and it is only after the obc is approved 
that expenditure can be committed and of course subject to affordability. The department will continue to work with PSNI around ongoing requirements and operational considerations which are a matter of course for the Chief Constable. You will also note from your pack that we have included bids for funding in relation to the tackling paramilitarism and together building and united community funding which we receive each year. This has been included to ensure a complete picture is provided of additional funding requirements. Finally, the department has put forward the current best assessment of the funding needs for the significant areas of historic investigations, compensation services, statutory discount rate and same household. In line with previous years, given the potential quantum of these costs, the expectation would be that these would need to be funded separately as again, they simply could not be absorbed within the department's budget. Holiday pay and legacy litigation are two areas which we continue to keep under review, but at this point, we have not sought to bid for additional funding. In addition to information on bids, we were asked to set out plans to live within baselines. With pressures of the significance outlined, you will appreciate these simply could not be absorbed without having a direct and immediate impact on frontline services. Ultimately, justice is a demand-led business and we have made significant savings in past years in areas which mean that to live within baseline would ultimately mean cuts. However, we must remember at this point that this is an NICS-wide exercise to inform decisions on funding and without clarity on what the NI budget position would be, we don't know what that budget will look like. So we hope that frontline services would not be affected to a significant degree if we receive a reasonable settlement. <coughs> this exercise is about providing an overall picture of pressures and understanding the impact if these were not funded to inform wider funding decisions. The committee will note from the PAC the bids we have made for additional capital funding but we'll also note that this is a significant request, so ultimately it will have to be reprioritized and reprofiled to live with, uh, with a, within the funding envelope that we are allocated. So finally, I just want to touch on prioritization. Whilst the request did ask for bids to be prioritized, this is a significant ask in a department with five agencies and eight non-departmental public bodies. We continue to work through this with our minister and the views of the committee are important in helping to inform this process. This will be an evolving process and we will ultimately want to fully align the budget to a multi-year programme for government. Whilst we had hoped that this would be a multi-year budget, we will continue to nudge that work forward internally and continue to make progress. So in conclusion, I hope I have provided a useful overview of the response that was provided to the AOF in terms of the issues we face going into the next budget period. We continue to operate with uncertainties around COVID-19 and Brexit, but we remain committed to update the committee as our position develops. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to provide this briefing, and we are happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Deborah. That's been very helpful. Um, in terms of the pay costs, just to check, that relates to pay inflation, that doesn't take into account uh, any increase in personnel, for example, in the police service or prison service for new recruits. Is that just the, the standing still of the current number of... Yeah, that's, that's the standing still, so then there are um, additional costs for additional posts um, associated with additional work, etc. And then separately, um, you will see um, some reference made to the strategic outline cases for the increase in police numbers, um, where um, the estimate is that in order to increase from the existing um, provision, the 7.5 would require approximately 40 million per annum when they are all in post, which of course would take a number of years for them to get to that position. And the vacancies that exist in terms of the core aspects of the department, um, yeah. Are, are they vacant because of the financial pressures or because of an inability to recruit people into them? 
So it's um, a, it's really to do with the um, issue around supply. Um, so there are some um, challenges at certain grades, um, and of course with COVID, some competitions were paused, but those are now back up and running. Um, and we are meeting internally to try and prioritise the current vacancies and those that we need to fill as quickly as possible um, and what actions need to be taken if we can't secure resource um, immediately and what that means for the work going forward. Okay. Um, and in terms then of your bid to DOF for things that you've outlined that shouldn't fall to the department to, to fund legacy was one of them and there's a number of other areas. Has there been contingency planning then if DOF aren't in a position to provide uh, that funding, what, would, what the impact would be on the Department of Justice and has that exercise highlighted the type of uh, work streams and programmes that would need to stop if that was the case? So when it comes to things like COVID and EU exit um, and NDNA, the, the, the size of those requests are so significant that we just simply couldn't um, absorb those um, within the baselines. Um, with regard to the others, we have looked at what that would mean for frontline services and it would have an impact on courts and on prisons and on police. Um, but as I said, we hope that those inescapable costs at a minimum would be met. But there would be massive challenges um, if we didn't get things like the COVID pressures and the EU exit, etc. met, uh, and, and it simply could, wouldn't be absorbed by this department. And can you give me a bit more detail on the COVID cost? Because I'm looking at the, the figures there, 36 million, 22 million, 18 million um, in 20, 23, 24 year. Yeah. So just let me get to my breakdown, which I did have. <laughs> so, um, so on the COVID, so um, what we spent, what we have, what we needed this year, um, if you recall, we got twenty five point nine million this year, and we um, had easements of nineteen million, um, mainly coming out of the fact that there was um, a reduction in the requirements around legal aid and compensation services. So you see there, there's about 46 million that we need this year for COVID and we have secured that and we keep that under review. So the amounts that we're asking for, um, you see, are actually decreasing from that moving forward. Um, so 30, 36 million um, in year one, 21.8 million in year two and 18.1 million in year three. Um, the breakdown of those, um, so you would have, I'll just maybe give you the year one sort of breakdown. PSNI um, around their PPE and IT about 8.7 million um, in uh, prisons, um, the provision of PPE and making sure that we're able to accommodate the social distancing about 11 million. Um, in courts, um, we know that COVID has an impact um, on the business and therefore on the income that is recoverable. So we're estimating maybe about 5 million would be there. Um, and in the case um, of um, LSA, if you recall, um, we gave back um, about thirteen and a half million pounds in the June monitoring round, and used that in order to um, fund our other COVID costs. Um, in October monitoring round, we had to revisit that. If you recall, we gave them back three million, so there's about ten million um, of activity there that they're trying to make up. So there's nine million of that going into next year, and the other million into the year after. Um, and then we have some other small um, elements of about 2.2 million across the department. So that's sort of a broad breakdown um, of those COVID costs, which are not dissimilar from this year's, but in fact are actually um, slightly less. Okay. Well, I'll be interested to to look to look at this one in more detail because I think most people sure. will be most people will be shocked that even up to 23 20, year 23 24 that we're still operating on the assumption that. COVID is a problem, and never mind, um, never mind the first of April yeah. next year. I would have to say, Chair, that of course we have had to base this on what we would deem to be hopefully a worst case scenario, um, and we would hope that the position on COVID does improve um, over, over the next number of months and years, hopefully. Okay, in terms of some of the, the money, I know the Minister for Finance has talked about departments holding on to funding, that he wants to make sure they're not just doing that. Um, uh, and the event occurs where they're not actually able to spend it. I think DOJ are holding is it just over two million at the minute. Are, are you planning to get the two million spent? 
So um, you recall the two million um, was being held um, because we were still scoping what might be required for the Nightingale Courts um, and also trying to um, ensure that we understood what might happen on the court's income side. Um, we are currently going through the process um, of our January monitoring round um, and we're collecting um, all of the information on that. Um, so we'll be in a better position um, in a couple of weeks time um, to give you an update on that. So um, at the moment, we are hoping that we will be able to, to live within budget. Um, and if um, we need, we can re-divert that two million pounds elsewhere in the department if it's not needed. Um, for the uh, Nightingale Courts or for the uh, the Courts income, but I think at this point it's reasonable to assume that some costs will be incurred on the Nightingale Courts. Okay, it will get spent though. You won't get to the end of the financial year and it'll, it'll be sitting there and too late to spend elsewhere. So I don't know what will happen between now and the end of the financial year and we're basing that on a number of assumptions around COVID. Um, you know, obviously we're in a second wave now um, and we don't know what might happen, but uh, on current projections, we're hoping we'll live within budget. As I say, we're doing some more work of the, over, on this over the next couple of weeks and I'd be better placed to answer that question um, then, Chair. Okay, well, listen, that, that's fair enough insofar as it goes because there are businesses crying out for money and if departments are sitting on funding that they're not going to spend, it can be redirected to the private sector, which is in desperate need of it. So. I'm sure you're alert to, to the, the wider public interest in making sure this funding is actually spent um, before the end of the year. Okay, I'm going to bring in other members at this stage um, that have asked quite, want to ask questions. So Emma, and then I'll bring in Paul. <coughs> Thanks, Chair. Um, in the pack, you, you have details around the um, 53 million that's required, and it's um, detailed for historical investigations and, and other um, bits and pieces. Um, will that um, 53 million, is, is that needed if there is no HIU established? And what will it be used for? Can we get a breakdown of, of where exactly that will be spent? Um, for example, Vaughan um, vouchers dealing with a number of legacy investigations. So is the money going to be used for the likes of that to bring in outside um, police services to investigate legacy cases? Um, my other question is around, um, will there be, is there any plans in place for any cuts to services to absorb any of these pressures or indeed cuts to any of the workforce to absorb any of these pressures that you have? So, um I think as, as I outlined um, in the opening remarks, it would be really difficult for this department um, to absorb those without having an impact on the frontline services. Um, and of course, as you know, the majority of our budget is on staffing. Um, so yes, if, if we didn't get this money and had to fund some of these ourselves, then that would have a significant impact. Um, all, on those ones that you're, you're referring to, um, the historical investigation, so I mean, that, that is the element um, which um, Oponi are saying that, that they need just to, to continue with some work on this and of course we await um, further decisions around that area. Um, on the compensation services one, this is the um, direct impact um, of the statutory discount rate hitting um, of the about is it estimated to be about 30 million pounds so that's where we're going through the process of reviewing the statutory discount rate and the change. We are seeing that people are, are holding off putting in their claims um, awaiting um, confirmation of that discount rate. So we expect that to hit, hit next year. Um, that is a, a working assumption and that's why that is so large. And then the remainder of three million per annum is around the same household, um, which um, you'll be aware of, um, which was um, corrected this year. So that is the impact of that one coming in. Um, and the, the legal aid large um, case exceptionality, um, we have um, a, a number um, of, of high volume cases um, on, on the legal aid side, um, there are three specific cases. Um, there's a 36 defendant case before the Crown Court um, in which we have three groups of defendants, a main contractor, a number of subcontractors and others um, who were involved in, in some money changing and um, who are facing um, a range of, char of charges um, involving defrauding the HMRC. And this case is highly unusual um, in respect of the number of defendants and the complex relationship between them. There's another case, um, which is a 30 defendant case before the magistrate's court, um, and the charges arise from alleged stage road traffic accident resulted in um, alleged insurance fraud. And there's a third case before the magistrate's court for committal, and it involves alleged offences of fraud again against HMRC. So those are those exceptional cases. 
um, which we estimate to cost about £9 million over the three-year three period. Um, so that's really the, the background to those. Um, I'm not sure if colleagues want to comment on, on the, the other elements. Okay, I just have one more. I'm sorry, you broke up a little bit, Emma, um, while you were talking, so I hope that I covered all of the things that you've mentioned there. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Emma, um, I just have one more. Um, um, short question. Um, the problem solving um, justice piece, um, we, we have seen that it not only has better outcomes for the individuals and families and communities, can the department give us a commitment that these kind of initiatives will get funding priority in, in the face of these pressures that, user face, that the, the department's facing? If I maybe pick that one up, um, I'm aware the, the committee took a paper a couple of weeks ago on a problem solving justice five year plan. As Deborah said, the, the key year that we're looking at is uh, the 21-22 year. Um, so just, just to give some assurance, the baseline for problem solving justice uh, that's included in the department's baseline funding and allocated to the respective areas is about £2.6 million. Pounds. That problem solving justice five year plan said that for the 21-22 year, the forecast costs were about £2.7 million. Pounds. So I think it's safe to assume that by and large, problem solving justice costs for that year um, are effectively funded. There's a, a very small gap, but we don't think that that will be a problem. So hopefully that gives assurance that um, as things stand, there's sufficient baseline funding to take problem solving justice, justice forward as planned in that year. Okay, thank you. Next chair. Okay, thank you. Linda? My question's actually a follow-up to, to that one. So. <clears throat> Glenn, just to clarify, that there was an issue that came to the committee a few weeks ago around the support hubs, which would is part of the five-year plan on problem-solving justice, and yet we're being told that there's an issue around funding for it. So if it's part of the five-year plan, then there shouldn't be any question around funding, and what I would be a wee bit concerned about is that if the department is saying this is part of our five-year plan, but we intend for somebody else to pay for it, or for it to be paid out of an, another source which is essentially also part of problem solving justice and that is the, the PCSPs. So and I'd just like a wee bit of clarity around that. Is it the intention of the department to fund the support hubs directly and not asking the PCSPs to fund them for them? Um, I'm happy to respond to that Linda. Um, so yes there, there was a bit of a concern um, partly, I think, about communication. Um, so essentially, at the moment, there's about a, a £3,000 contribution through PCSPs to the support hubs. Um, we're in the process now of working with local government and PCSPs to, to come up with a better way of doing that, because actually, they're not all funded the same way. Um, but just, just to reiterate what Glyn said, it's really important work, and it's absolutely something that we'll want to support, is just working out the right mechanism to do that. The mechanism is one thing, and I and I, I know exactly what you're saying but from my previous life on the placing board. So I know that I, I understand where you're coming from in terms of that they don't all work exactly the same. But I just want that reassurance that the funding for the hubs is coming from the department directly. And whilst yes, I accept some PCSPs make a contribution, whether it's through personnel or through um, <clears throat> actual finance they do make some contribution i acknowledge that but is there funding coming from the department for the hubs so, so i think at the moment it's not quite as direct as that and one of the things we're going to look at is is that easier i mean some of them aren't funded at all because actually the work is done through local government or through pcsps but just to restate it's important valuable work um in, in the wider community safety space, so we are very supportive of it. I'm, I'm confident we'll get that work through in the next couple of weeks. Okay. Okay, Paul. Thank you, Chair, and thanks very much for presentation and answers so far. Uh, again, fascinating subject with regards to long-term planning, uh, and there's certainly a part of crystal ball gazing in all of this. I, I recognise that. Uh, and so as we go further into the future, figures have to be placed in context and and. Uh, treat it as such. But we've been constantly preached at with regards to living in the new normal. It strikes me that living in a new normal would be a very good time to bring in efficiency savings and to do things differently. 
in order to run departments better. Uh, can I ask from each of the people, players around the table there, what efficiency savings are you making at this time as we live in the new normal and how it will that affect the budgets going forward? of reforms going on um, around the department, modernisation and transformation. Um, there have already been reductions made in, in areas such as, as legal aid, for example. Um, the department has already um, absorbed cuts um, of over 9% um, since, um, I think it was 2011-12. Um, so we have made significant reductions. Um, I mean, there have been large reductions um, on, on Ronnie's side, um, where there have been operational reductions, nearly 29%, I think it is. Um, I mean, I'll let each of them speak to those, but there has been significant um, um, efficiencies made across this department over the past number of years, and we have taken on a significant amount of additional work. Um, and um, probably take all afternoon to actually talk through all of that. Um, I'm quite happy to come back to the committee on but um, if my colleagues want to maybe say a wee bit about their own business areas as well. Ronnie. I mean, if I, I can pick that up, Paul, uh, I mean, Deborah's absolutely right. Uh, if you look at the prison service budget between 2010, for example, and now, uh, I mean, you see real efficiencies in terms of a very significant number uh, or a very significant staff reduction number. Um, and a very significant reduction in the funding. We, as you know, have our, our Prisons 2020 programme at the moment, uh, which is about modernisation, about continuous improvement, and about uh, about efficiency. But but I would have to be honest with the committee and say that in the in the current environment, uh, where we're trying to to deal with the challenges of COVID, um, delivering efficiencies it would be very very difficult. Um, and I'm not sure what further efficiencies we would be able uh, to deliver without us starting to take some fairly significant action and stopping uh, some of the things that we're doing. Um, and if we were to do that, uh, you know, it would undoubtedly have a very detrimental impact on the rehabilitation agenda uh, that we've been pushing through Prisons 2020 over the past um, couple of years. Uh, if I maybe answer that question in two parts, I suppose looking firstly at the, the core department and the access to justice space, uh, it, it's a relatively small departmental budget, but some of the reforms that we're doing won't necessarily release um, cash savings straight away, but they're designed to make the system better and I suppose therefore deliver longer term savings both to the justice system and further afield. And if I give three examples of that problem solving justice that we've already talked about this afternoon, that will make a difference beyond um, DOJ, the Gillen Review of Serious Sexual Offences that the committee is familiar with, and the world of speeding up justice. On the court service side of things, I suppose it's a similar story to, to what Ronnie has outlined in the prison service, where there have been budget cuts over recent years and, and therefore savings um, and efficiencies made. Um, one example is a reform of the court service fee structure, uh, which brought in significant additional income to help mop up pressures. Um, and I suppose in the longer term, uh, the committee will be familiar with the court service modernization portfolio. And that looks at a range of things, including, for example, the court service estate and the court service IT. And we believe there are real savings to be made there in the long run but that will require shorter term capital investment. And part of the figures that you have on the capital side um, of things relates to that capital funding needed to deliver those longer term savings in courts and tribunals. And I suppose from a safer community's perspective, I would, I would share Ronnie's um, view. I, I think all of the focus is on important and essential services. There's not, there's not a great deal of scope um, for efficiencies. I suppose the one Longer term, um, exciting opportunity is some of the transformation agenda, certainly that the police um, are looking at. So Deborah touched on on the three SOCs around digital officer numbers in estates. And over time, I think depending on the interdependencies of those three things, um, you could end up um, with efficiencies, but that will take time to work through as they move to a, a new operating model. Um, but it's not an immediate or short term fix by any means. Okay, thank you. And can I ask then, Monitoring rounds will become very important uh, if we ever get to a three-year or multi-year budget. Uh, they will take on a, a more significant role, I su would suggest. 
uh, more critical role. So uh, to me, there should be more democratic accountability with regards to monitoring rounds. What is the duty on the department at present in bringing forward their plans or bids in monitoring rounds? Sorry, I'm not sure I understand so, the question. So do, is there a duty placed on the department to bring to the scrutiny committee of any department uh, the bid before it's given to the Department of Finance? Or, or do you so, simply bring us the bid? So we would always try to bring it to you before it goes to the Department of Finance so that you can discharge your scrutiny role and can input to that and give us your views to make sure that those are taken on board. Sometimes the timing of that doesn't always lend itself to it. However, if we ever are unable to bring it to you before it goes to DOF, there's always a time lag in there between DOF um, collating all of that information and it's finding its way back into the executive. So there's always an opportunity for us to go back if there are uh, particular areas that the, the, the committee wants us to, to look at and revisit and we will bring that back to our minister, of course. So, so there wouldn't be an additional burden or difficulty if there was a statutory duty placed on departments to bring their monitoring round bids to the relevant committee before that bid was in to the Department of Finance? I think the challenge will be the timing of all of this. Um, because in a department the size of DOJ, with five agencies and eight non-departmental public bodies, collating the information takes quite a, a lot of time. And then obviously we have our internal processes, but you know, in principle, absolutely not. But it will obviously cause challenges for us around the timelines. It might reduce some of the timelines, and then we have the, the issue about how how much how much scrutiny have we had internally before it gets to you, etc. But look, we can work those things through. Um, but no, it wouldn't cause a, an issue. We could manage it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Thank you. A number of my questions have been answered, but I just wanted to pick up on what um, Linda was discussing in, in, in terms of the support hubs. If and, if and when that is rectified with funding through local government and PCSPs and the department, um, I would certainly appreciate an update on where that is um, and what's happening uh, with that, because I appreciate that they're all sort of funded differently, resourced differently, um, but just to kind of get the details that they are going to be funded. Um, and um, clear up any communication issue. No problem. Um, in terms of, I, I've, I know we've been talking about this for quite quite some time, but EU exit costs. I note on the um, response just on our table pack, and it's the department. It says the department continues to work with the justice partners um, in, on a range of planning scenarios, including deal and no deal. And at this stage, no additional costs have been identified. In addition to the costs relating to the protocol by PSNI, has there been any scenario planning aside from the PSNI costs? Is there any foreseen in either scenario cost to the department on EU exit? At the moment, it's all being related to, to the police, as far as I understand, so that's where it is at the moment. Okay, so it just in terms of either if there is a deal or no, no deal in the implementation of the protocol or so on, there is no, no additional cost to the department arising out of EU exit. It's only to the PSNI. As far as I'm aware, I'll go and double check that for you. So, so we're, we're working with a range of partners, particularly through the Organised Crime Task Force, um, and, and certainly at this stage, that's right. The only financial indication at the moment is, is for the extra, I think it's 300 officers. Yeah, 308. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe I'm just being naive with the Brexit process, but I find that very surprising that there would be no additional costs um, relating even to the discussions that the committee have had on data sharing, on European arrest warrants, on relationships with Angarda Shakona. Um, just that, that if, if there is no additional costs, depending on deal or no deal, then great, but apart from PSNI, but I, find, I do find that quite surprising and I hope I'm, um, I'm proved wrong on that. Um, but I appreciate the feedback from the department. Um, in terms of the PSNI numbers, 
and maybe it's just a point of clarity. On the, the submission, it says about the additional police officers, which of course the committee have debated and the assembly have debated as well. It says that the, um, it is intended that the costs will be met through overtime, but then there is yeah. a bid for further financing on that. Could you maybe explain what that means? So the, the police um, have originally asked us for funding for the extra 100 officers this year, which of course we weren't able to provide. The police have gone back and, and reprioritised their budget and have said that um, by reducing some overtime that they will be able to start to bring in um, the 100 officers. I think it's important to note that they'll be bringing the 100 officers in towards the very end of this financial year, which means there's only a small proportion of the full cost of the 100 officers heading this year. Um, and the PSNI will have to look at how they manage that next year, dependent um, on the budget that is then allocated. Okay, so it's the 100 officers rather than the, f the further additional ones that we discussed? Yes. Okay, yes. that's fine. Um, the final, I suppose, the COVID costs, so I know something that that's what the chair had picked up on, and, and certainly I would welcome to tease that out. That's basically said that was based on worst case scenario. Is worst case scenario the scenario that we're in right now or the scenario that we were in in March to June? Um, <laughs> I just want to try and get my head around what that looks like. Um, I think it's fair to say that lessons have been learned and as, you, as we know, um, areas like the courts um, uh, and in prisons have been very innovative in the way they can still deliver parts of their business. We have like, jury trials and all the rest of it up and running. So what we're hoping is that we can build on that. So you see the costs coming down. So that is on the basis that we will continue to innovate around this area um, and make improvements. So it's a worst case scenario based on the fact that we will continue to learn and make changes and adapt um, as, as time goes on. Okay, and I appreciate it as a very fluid situation and we don't know what's going to happen in a week, let alone in two years' time. Um, so I know I do appreciate it as a very much a crystal ball looking. Um, finally, in, I think it's page 127 of our pack, it was point, uh, paragraph 72, and it said about savings measures required to live within baseline, and it said about Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunals civil fees. Could you maybe tell me what those civil fees are? In terms of a breakdown of the no, just fees. what they are and what that means, because I know it says okay. in terms of it's relatively small, starting at two hundred and seventy-five thousand pounds and increasing to six hundred thousand pounds in twenty-three twenty-four. Just in, what does that mean, kind of practically? Okay, I'm just pausing because I may have a slightly different number pack to you, so I'm just trying yeah. to find the relevance. It's sentence. just paragraph um, seventy-two on the section on plans to live with in resource dial base lines? Okay, yeah, my, my understanding of that is that um, the court service have been uh, delivering a reform of their fee structure over the past few years, um, which, although on one hand it doesn't deliver savings, it delivers increased income, and that increased income can help offset pressures. So this is another tranche of those uh, civil fee increases that will uh, deliver that the amounts of money in your pack. Um, I'll revert maybe to court service colleagues who might be able to give us more breakdown of what actual fees deliver those amounts of money. But I know there are a range of different civil fees. They make up different percentages of the total civil fee income. But I'll be able to come back to you with a breakdown of what actual civil fees make up those numbers if you're content with that. Thank you, no, I appreciate that. It's just to try and tease out if that's something that the committee has already been addressed on and agreed to, or is this new, potentially new fee structuring coming down the line, just because it does extend, obviously, 275k in 21-22, and then um, more than doubling within 23-24? As part of that confirmation, I, I'll make sure we split that between fees that have been agreed by the committee and are in place, and if there's any element of that which propose new ones, but I can assure you if there propose new ones, we'd be working with the committee as that was developed. No, thank you. I appreciate that. It's just out of interest. Thank you. Okay, can I bring in Sinead Bradley? Thank you, Chair. I um, appreciate that. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank 
you, Sinead. Yes. Thank you, yes, because it was having difficulty um, with the hand up system in the earlier part of the meeting. Um, thank you for the presentation. I, I'd just like to reiterate the importance of fully understanding that statement about the uh, financial implications of the EU exit. I too was a little bit taken back by that, um, particularly given not just the presentations from the PSNI, which talked about suboptimal options and how laborious they were and labour intensive um, costs, but also across the justice family, I had an understanding that there would be a ripple effect, effect there. So I would appreciate a clearer assertion on that um, particular topic. You, I would also like to make the point, uh, you talk about how there's very little scope, I suppose, left within the department to be able to um, cushion or carry, absorb any further financial pressures that it may face. And I just did wonder, when you make um, your you know, submissions to the Department of Finance, do you outline that? How, how directly do you speak to the Department of Finance about what that would mean for frontline services and what the impact would be? And I take your point there about um, investing in um, projects that would service a longer term saving is you know do you outline to the department of finance that if we haven't this budget or, and we and we're forced to stop on this the implications are we won't see the savings as projected in year two three four and five going ahead um, yeah. and i just also want to just while i i have the mic i'm keeping it um, <laughs> the, the capital dell project you mentioned there the police ombudsman and um, that there's a higher and um, return in this year could you explain what that is? And could you also tell me, NDPB in general, is there pressure on them to help achieve um, efficiencies across the department? Thank you. Okay, so um, first of all, there is a detailed template um, where we outline the implications um, if, if these pressures were not met. Um, of course, we will be supplying the committee with, with those detailed um, templates, so that is all in there. So you will see around each business area where we have clearly articulated the impact that this would have on frontline services. Um, on the Oponi one, I'm, I'm not sure maybe, um, but what we were talking about was to do with the historical investigations and that we had a pressure there um, in Oponi that we're bidding for, which is resource, so it's not capital. Um, and then on your other point, which is around the NDPBs, we've been working very closely with the NDPBs throughout this process, um, ensuring um, that we are clear about what is truly inescapable, understanding what cuts and savings they have absorbed in the past, um, and what that would mean for them if they did not get their budget allocation. And again, that is covered um, in, in the templates that have been given to DOF around the implications for the arms length bodies of living within them. And that will give you a sense of really we are at the point where we can't absorb anything. We will have to stop things. We will have to pause things. Um, we will have to slow down things. Um, those are the sorts of really tough decisions that we will have ahead of us. Um, and when we get our funding envelope, it will give us a better idea um, of how far down we need to go on this. Sinead, you Thank you, Chair. Thank you. You're okay. Okay, is there any other members? No. Okay. Um, Deborah, can I thank you and the team for your time? There, there's a few other questions that we, we had, but I'm happy that I can follow up on them in writing to you. But um, for now, if I can just pass all my thanks to yourselves for joining with us. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Okay, members, um, if you're content, what some of the questions in the clerk's memo, we'll just will follow up with the department uh, and ask for a written reply to them. Um, there's also just this broader issue, and I asked about it around any contingency planning in the event that they don't get funding, um, and they, they they've just touched on it tangentially, in my opinion. Um, but obviously, they will have collated this type of information. Um, that's that it's bound to have happened and um, so if, if you're happy we will request details of the information that has been collated as part of their future year's budget 
um, and actions that have already been taken and any corresponding impacts to live within reduced budgets um, and then the actions and reduction of measures that are required going forward to live within their budgets along with corresponding impacts. So we will formally ask for that because that will have some more detail. In my experience, you always carry out this exercise and your NDPBs say, if we don't have five million, here's what it means, this is what it looks like. Um, and we haven't got that, so let's formally ask um, and see what response we get back. Um, okay, then item six is the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, and pages 137 to 149 of your meeting pack. Um, committee, as members will know, agreed to bring forward six amendments um, at the consideration stage of the bill, and they have been submitted. Um, and are scheduled then for next Tuesday for the uh, debate in the Assembly on this. So the Minister has now written outlining her position in relation to each of these amendments. Um, the Minister supports one of the committee amendments, doesn't support two of them, and then has provided um, amendments of her own in relation to three of the amendments uh, which we have put in. So members, we know we have discussed this all at length. You're well versed in all of these issues. Uh, as a contingency, um, Veronica Holland uh, is available through the Starley facility should members require any further, further, further information. But if you don't, I don't intend to go to uh, Dr Holland to go through the Minister's amendments. Um, members should be able to understand them. But if there's some points of clarity and there's maybe one or two areas that I might tease out with her, members are at liberty to, to ask for um, to do that. So um, l let me just go through each of the amendments in order uh, listed in the Minister's response um, for the benefit of committee members, um, and, and we can handle them um, in that respect. So the first one obviously was around the uh, domestic abuse protection notices or orders, um, um, which the Minister has indicated her position in being opposition to it, which gives the reasons why. Um, uh, so obviously, members, we are pressing with an amendment which has been tabled on this. Um, the minister's position doesn't change my position in uh, respect of it. Um, ultimately, if the minister wishes to bring this forward in primary legislation, as she's indicated through the miscellaneous provisions bill, she can do that, and she can repeal then this amendment if we pass it. So, you know, there's there's no obstacle to the minister taking the course of action that she wants to take. Um, that isn't predicated on uh, the committee's uh, amendment um, that's being moved next Tuesday. So, um, unless members have a different view to that, then we would press ahead with the uh, the amendment. Um, no members are content. Yeah. The the operation encompass um, aspect of this. Obviously, the minister is off the view which we know, members, that the committee um, relating to it may not um, adequately provide for the necessary regulations uh, to be brought forward, as in she thinks that it's likely outside the scope of the bill. So she has tabled an alternative uh, amendment um, to it, which she believes ensures as robust as possible and provides for a structured framework enabling the detail to be set out in regulations in consultation with partners in the Department of Education and the text then of the Minister's amendment is available. Um, the committee amendment provides a vehicle for the implementation of Operation Encompass. The Minister's amendment provides for what the committee wants um, but is much more detailed and it is more comprehensive. Um, so in terms of some of the options that, the, that, that we have, um, the committee could therefore decide not to move its amendment and support the Minister's amendment, assuming that it's deemed admissible. Of course, that would still achieve the committee's aim, which would be a result. Um, ultimately, that's why we've pressed for this. Um, it would have been more helpful if the department had came up with this whenever we had asked them, but they didn't. Um, that's a tactical position that they've taken on a number of these, which is worth bearing in mind as to how we proceed. Um, but notwithstanding that, um, Obviously, we can look at the department's amendment um, uh, around what they have put forward. If both are found to be admissible, um, and here's the issue about our committee amendment, and then I'll, I'll bring Linda in, um, 
it's likely that the, the Minister's amendment would be taken first, and therefore the Committee's amendment, um, if, if the Minister's amendment is passed, the Committee's amendment um, it wouldn't be taken. Um, but there is also the issue that uh, our amendment uh, is drafted very neatly to, to hopefully ensure it is in scope. There may be an issue about the Minister's amendment being outside of scope, and ours may not be. Um, so uh, that, that's something, I suppose, that the Committee needs to, to bear in mind and in all of this, and I'll, I'll use this for some of the other things that she's suggested. Our amendment can be passed by the Assembly and then at further consideration stage it can be tidied up and it can do exactly what the Minister's amendment has done. So you know, there's a number of issues just to consider in respect of, respect of that. Linda? Um, first of all, just to place on record, Operation Encompass is something that I have raised, I think, since, if not the very first day I came onto this committee, very close to it. So I would have appreciated, as you've outlined, that something had been brought forward. And I accept that there is the potential that it's not within scope. But the Department were able to come forward with this amendment now, even in light of the fact that it may well still <coughs> potentially not be within scope. So I would have appreciated it had it come forward sooner because it certainly would have shortened our like very lengthy conversations around it mm -hmm. and been helpful to the committee and and I mean you know we've talked earlier on about the minister's wish to have a good relationship with the committee so I think that it would have been good to have had it and um, it's something that I have been pushing for and asked repeatedly questions and not only in this committee but previously in the policing board of the chief constable and others could they please tell me where the legislative gap was and I never actually got an answer to that question. Mm. And now when the Minister outlines in you know, in the event that this is not within scope, what her department intended to do anyway, why never at any stage was I made aware of that? Or was this committee made aware of that? So I am a wee bit annoyed about that, to be honest with you. But I mean I'm I'm not precious about it. The important thing is that we get this in. But I do think that 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 there was an opportunity to show that this this committee and the department are working together. You've highlighted this issue. The department has identified this is actually something that could be of benefit. Let's see what we can do together to to get to the right outcome. Now, hopefully, whatever happens, we're going to get to the right outcome. But I just wanted to place on the record because because I was a wee bit annoyed just the amount of times that has re repeatedly been brought up. And never at any point has anybody been able to answer for me where, first of all, even where, what the legislative gap was, or secondly, how that legislative gap could be addressed, which is why I sought to bring it into this bill. And you know, the, the rest of the committee members were in agreement on that. So I'm keen that, however, we put, go forward, that this is still addressed. And now that we have a commitment from the minister, in this response, or in this letter, to say that it was her intention to deal with it. If it is outside scope and doesn't isn't dealt with in this bill, I expect it to be dealt with. The department has now acknowledged there is a gap. They know what the gap is, and according to that letter, they can fix it or did intend to. So I expect whatever happens, that that is actually dealt with. That legislative gap is is addressed. So members, in terms of just dealing with it. Um and, and once the, the minister put forward the amendment, obviously I got advice to make sure, you know, in terms of the detail of it, um, it is more comprehensive and does what we want it to do. Um, now, the issue there is, I suppose, from a procedural point of view, is it the committee's view that we would support the minister's amendment and therefore then we don't move our amendment? Um, well, when I say that, if the minister's is called, then... If the committee's view is we're supporting it, obviously then once it's voted on, ours falls in that respect. But you know, I would then wouldn't move our the committee amendment at that stage. Um, and is is that the the preferred way that the committee wants to go forward on this? So, Paul, then Rachel. Yeah. So I think we are in a dilemma because whilst you have a time. Uh, chair to in, you know to look at the new clause that the minister has produced. Uh, what we did in two lines, the Minister has took a page to do. Now, that might be a good thing, 
But there might be a subclause in that amendment that I don't like, and I just have not had the time to look at it. Now, I reserve my judgment until I get to the floor of the Assembly uh, and to vote on these clauses and these amendments. Uh, but here lies that problem, because if they have been, and they know they have, they have been looking in on this committee through its deliberations for months. And did they not think that we were determined enough to bring forward this amendment on Operation Encompass? I just, if they think that we weren't determined enough, I don't know where they've been. So this is one, one example, I agree entirely with the Deputy Chair, this is one where they could have come early on. I know legislative process and I know there's a poker game to play in some aspects, but if they really wanted to take ownership of their own bill and they really wanted to move forward in a spirit of compromise and partnership, really this is the one that they could have come much earlier to us and says, yep, we, we measure and have assessed the, the determination within the committee uh, and so here we're going to work with you. They didn't do that. They failed to do that, in fact. They failed to do that. Uh, so I think, yes, we, we move, we, we lodge our, uh, our amendment and then the intent of moving it. And then uh, if this is passed, again, the danger is I don't know the exact impact of this new clause because I haven't had the time to digest it. It's a page long. So... Uh, I'm taking it on your word, Chair, that this is a better clause than our own, which is good and to be welcomed if that is the case. But I, as an individual MLA, don't, haven't had time to see that yet. So uh, it's nearly too late in the day to ask this committee to support anything. Uh, but I, I will take your, your judgment on this, and when we get to the floor of the Assembly, then it's... Anything and everything goes with regards to votes. I'll leave it there, Chair. Okay. Rachel. Thanks, Chair. I think this is going to be one of a number of issues that could have been brought much, much earlier by the Department. And like Deputy Chair, we would have we had had this signed off months ago because it was brought up from day one. My concern, like Paul's, is does this amendment do what ours does? Or we know that this this the, this this amendment run again. Like Paul, I briefly read it because it came, you know, two days ago, mm -hmm. uh, a week before we were supposed to, you know, come to a position on it and vote on it, and two days before this meeting. But this is obviously a, in a response to our amendment. Um, and my reading of the new clause is that it does the same thing of ours. It brings it gives the power to bring regulations. Does this plug the gap? What is the gap? I'm still waiting on, and like, like Linda, I'm still waiting on an answer of what this legislative gap actually is. And I can't come to a, you know, a position on the, new, on the Minister's Amendment, and I would certainly be um, in support of us continuing with ours, because what is the difference between ours and the Minister's? If ours does the same thing, why, you know, what, what's the need? Um, and we haven't had um, any time to scrutinise it, and it's a one, two, three, four, seven line explanatory note on the letter that we have received from the minister. So um, certainly be happy to press ahead with buddies. Shanita Bradley. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, just reflecting back, you know, we did spend a lot of time on this issue and it, and there was huge agreement on it. But the further, the more detailed we proposed to be, it appeared that we were getting uh, beyond scope. And I think we arrived at our um, amendment the way it is for good reason. And I'm just trying to work through the procedure now. So I can't make a determination at this moment in time. Um, I understood our amendment. I don't know what the ministers bring that's added value, and I don't know if that additional context puts it out of scope. So the process now will be the marshalled list of amendments, which I understand will have a legal eye cast over that, where the speaker then will make a determination of what can come in to the floor. Is that right? And so, so at that point, 
can we assume that if the minister's amendment made it to the floor, that it has been determined that it can um, be discussed at that point? And I, I just want to get it over the line at this point. I think committee members are right, you know, to, to raise their um, despair, really, at how it's come about. But I think right now, under the pressure of the time remaining, um, I just want to find out logistically, how do we get it across the line? Um, well, I suppose procedurally, the committee's amendments are in, so they're, they're tabled. Um, we'll find out today if this, or, um, I think it's later today, the Speaker will have ruled on all the amendments. Um, so we'll know if our committee amendment has been selected. I suppose it's only at that point we'll know if the Minister's amendment has also been selected. Um, and procedurally then, um, I've been advised that it would be the Minister's amendment on this Operation Encompass that would be taken before the committee's. Now that would leave committee members then, you know, in a position where to get to the committee amendment, we need to vote down the minister's amendment, um, and I suppose that puts members in a dilemma. You know, is what the the minister seeking to do uh, in line with what we are seeking to do? Now, I've been told by the bill officer, uh, the, the bill clerk that's advised the committee, this does, and it's more comprehensive. Now, granted, that's just what I've been informed, and we as a committee haven't been able to interrogate the legislative text in a way that you would have had the department produce this um, during the normal phase of the, the committee scrutiny stage. That That's a decision that the, the, the minister of the department took. Um, that's up to them, but it does leave members in a, in a dilemma. Um, but again... That's going to be an issue. I don't know if the Minister's amendment, nor indeed if the Committee's amendment on Operation Encompass is going to be selected. I think ours is much easier to get in, in my opinion, than the Minister's. And if that's the case, then this is a mute point. And at that stage, at further consideration stage, then the Minister, which is the normal protocol, um, would then bring forward a uh, tidying up amendment so it achieves what we want as a committee in line with the amendment passed by the Assembly. Um, so it, it's not helpful, though, if both amendments get selected by the Speaker, what members are then going to do. And in all of this, and at this point, I think I, I would make to some other amendments, the strength of a committee is in a committee acting in unison. When a committee breaks away from that, then it dilutes the strength of a committee, and that would be something that the Department would look at for future bills. You know, that they know that there's an ability to, to get cracks between us. And there are some aspects of committee amendments that I, on balance, maybe wouldn't have supported, but there were other amendments that I wanted to get through and other members may not have supported, and we, we reached a consensus amongst all of us. Um, and that's just something to say now in, in anticipation of some of these other amendments to discuss. But I'm not sure, Sinead, that you know, procedurally that's the way it will be dealt with. Speaker will decide if the amendments are admissible. If both are admissible, it's the Minister's amendment that comes first. Uh, and I'm not clear just at this stage then what we as a committee you know, would do because we're meeting today, this is on Tuesday. We won't have a committee position. Then it's up to individual members. Are you going to vote for the Minister's amendment or do you vote for the committee amendment? And that'll mean voting down the Minister's amendment. Yeah. Um, Can I just say on that point, I, I don't think we're in the committees in a position today to, to come to a committee view on it. You know, we all maybe need to go off and satisfy ourselves that the assertion is right, that it's our amendment and some more. And if that's the case, you know, and there's there is added value to it, then um, I suppose maybe members who are satisfied that that's the case may be satisfied to support it. But it's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's not really a, a nice way of doing business at the moment. Yeah. Certainly not, Paul. There is another way. And if the Minister values the special relationship with its committee, then there's no reason why the Department can't withdraw this or not move it and give this committee a warning that they're not going to move it. Allow our amendment to proceed and then there's nothing to stop the Department admitting and moving this new clause which they have produced a further consideration stage. By that stage the committee will have formed a view. I was actually going to ask Chair is that something that can be done that the department can be asked to to do that. I know it will then be up to the minister and the department but none of that precludes the minister from getting 
our amendment in because we're, we're now saying that you know that that is how we intend to proceed we we don't have any difficulties but it, it sounds like a better way forward than the committee dividing on something that is their own amendment effectively so members yes i'm sure that we could ask that the question for members of the committee would then be if the minister if her amendment is selected but decides i'm not doing that then what does the committee members and parties do at that stage and that's me starting to move into something that's not my responsibility yeah. what so, a party does so the danger here for the department is this if we were to vote down that what which we think is a perfectly good amendment by the department if we vote that down and then support our own the minister won't be able to move this at further consideration stage no well no that, that's not right in the sense that at further consideration stage you can bring forward amendments so long as it's in line with the amendment that was passed so you know the minister can bring forward an amendment um because it's again it's a clarifying more what the assembly has a, has agreed so this wouldn't the minister's amendment not being passed and ours being passed would not then stop either the department or this committee because we now have the legislative yeah, yeah. text yeah. Can so I I make a suggestion based on that, that if the minister does not withdraw her amendment, and this is, this is a position, I'm, I'm trying to get to a point where we have a committee position on this, yeah. is really where I'd like to be, because our amendment is a committee amendment, and I don't want us to now divide on it. So could we request that the minister withdraw her amendment with a view to putting it in as a tidy and up at further consideration? If she doesn't withdraw it, we do vote it down. We support our own amendment and we say to the Minister, but we are content for this to be part of the tidying up process at further consideration. So we're not ruling out that it will will come in at a further stage because I want to get a committee position without cutting off our nose to spider face. Yep. Um, Christine, can I just check with you? Is that the conversation that you've had that if our amendment gets passed, that this could then be brought forward at further consideration stage by either the committee or the minister? Um, I haven't had a conversation about whether that particular text can. Um, the position is that uh, amendments can go in at further consideration stage to tidy up or improve the text um, of amendments that have been made or clause provisions that are now in the bill as long as you're not changing the intent. So when the House agrees um, on the intent of something, then at further consideration stage you can't change that intent, but you can tidy up, improve. So I suppose if I'm looking at the committee amendment, the intent is very clear. You want to provide for the PSNI to be able to contact schools. Um, our amendment is quite small. It doesn't set out a lot of detail. Um, my assumption would be if the Assembly supports that intent and makes the provision, then that could then be tidied up or improved at further consideration stage as long as you're not going against that intent. So you couldn't, I think, put down an amendment at further consideration stage that would revert that intent, but you could improve on it. Whether that would include all of the text of... of the Minister's Amendment, I don't know, we'd, ha we'd have to take advice on that, but you could improve, you can improve on the drafting of amendments at further consideration stage, as long as you don't change the intent that the House has agreed to. Okay, are members content then, sorry, I'm just looking at Sinead, I think, is that you coming in, yeah? I'm a bit cautious about that because without understanding fully the Minister's intent, is there a danger of us throwing out something that can't then, you know, and it may really have an added value? Is there a danger that we're throwing out something that there's no route back in with? Veronica is, is sitting there. Um, Veronica, do you want to come in now, having heard the, the debate? Um, around what the Minister's amendment on this is trying to do and what the committee amendment was trying to do. I 
I'm not sure if um, Dr. Holland sure, can, I? can be brought into the spotlight by the broadcasting team. Can I quickly clarify something just for Sinead? Yes, go ahead. Sinead, if the Minister doesn't bring her amendment forward, if, if our amendment was to go through on Tuesday and the Minister doesn't bring her amendment, she just says, that's OK, your amendments went, I'm not going to do this. We can, as a committee, we can take that text and bring it forward as a committee ourselves at further consideration stage. So we don't lose it, is what I'm, is it, but I understand what you're... If, but only, following from what Christine said, Linda, but only if we're not introducing a new idea. And are we satisfied that there is no novel new? At, because they're talking about the legal advice so far, or the advice so far is that this goes beyond what we do. Well, what is that piece that goes beyond? And can that be injected in at a later stage? I have a fear that it may not be. There could be something in that that would actually change the intent of that clause. So until I fully understand it, I'm cautious about dismissing it. Uh, but, but yet, through the chair, that's one of the reasons why you shouldn't vote for it, because if we're not sure, uh, Absolutely. we need, we need yeah. time. Uh, and with, with the minister not moving this on Tuesday, it gives the committee time. And you know something, if this is the best amendment that the, the Department of Justice have ever created, I support it 100% of further consideration stage, and the minister's name can be all over it. Rachel, and then I'll come to Dr Holland. Thank you. Sorry, again, just to tease this out, and, and back to my, my first point, these amendments to me both do the same thing. They're both trying to provide a structured framework to enable the detail to be set out in regulations. Mm -hmm. We're not actually plugging any gap here. We're making provision for a gap to be plugged. So surely anything, regardless if it's ours or the minister's, Regulations still have to be laid to this effect. Okay. So what is the substantive difference? I don't see it because, again, we still don't have the answer on what legislation it is that is, there, there is a gap there in. We still don't know. Right. So until I can be told what that is, the two are the, the same thing. And that's a fair point. Dr Holland. Can you hear me? I can indeed, yes. Thank you, Veronica. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Um, thanks, Chair, for the opportunity to... to Brief the, the committee in relation to this. I suppose the one thing that I would want to say at the outset is that we have never at any point um, intended to be disrespectful towards the committee. And um, we have been very clear that uh, there was very much a desire for this provision to be introduced. We were of the view and, and are of the view that we were not convinced that this will be deemed to be within the scope and is why we hadn't brought this provision forward. The intention had been very much um, to bring this forward through another legislative vehicle. That is why we hadn't drafted something at an earlier stage, but given the committee amendment, our view was that um, in, in terms of the scope of it, we think it's quite restrictive um, and may not necessarily give us all of the um, enabling provisions in terms of the detail and the regulations that will be needed. So, for example, references made to schools. Our sense is we're also going to have to cover further education colleges. That reference to schools wouldn't be sufficient in that respect. So. That's a, an example of, of some of the, the aspects where we would be off the view that the, the committee amendment may not quite do what we needed to do. In terms of the legislative gap piece, and um, our apologies again if this, I thought we had made this clear in, in both the letter that had been sent in relation to these amendments and an earlier correspondence. Essentially, all of the legislation that is there at the moment in relation to information sharing for the purposes of a scheme such as this relates to child protection, child safeguarding. The purpose of an Operation Encompass um, approach is for child well-being. So it's, a, it's about kind of the needs of the, the child. If, if they come to school and, for example, don't have their uniform or, um, you know, PE kit is missing or they're particularly distressed, it's about enabling the school to be able to look at that or, or to be made aware of um, the incident that has happened and take account of that in, in terms of their treatment of the child. So essentially, there is no legislation available at the moment, and this has been checked with both police, um, our own legal advisors, and also advice was taken by the safeguarding board. There isn't legislation available at the moment that will allow this information to be shared for child well-being purposes. It could only be shared if it was for child protection purposes. An operation in Compass is not about child protection because obviously the, um, the police have been involved at that stage and, and what have you. So the legal advice that we have been provided with is very clear that there is 
there is a gap in terms of that information sharing provisions. In terms of the discussion that the committee was having about, um, I suppose, the processes in, in relation to um, your amendment, the department's amendment, etc., etc., my understanding is, and I know it was suggested, that the committee amendment potentially um, be moved and see if that's within scope. The department potentially considers bringing its amendment forward at, at consideration stage. That's obviously something that I would need to take the, the view of the minister on. Um, and, you know, before we would give any commitment in relation to that. I suppose the only thing that I would say in relation to, and, and obviously we would want to seek her views in terms of not moving our amendment to allow the committee um, to put forward its amendment. And again, our apologies in, in that, in, in no way, way was this meant to be disrespectful to the committee. Um, we felt that it was, it, it was done with the intention of trying to be helpful and, and have a more comprehensive um, vision. Um, you know, so if, if we had known or appreciated that the preference would be that we would have brought something forward for the consideration stage. We certainly could have done that, um, but thought it was helpful to bring it forward at, at this point rather than, than leave it to the later stage. My understanding, and, and I'm, I'm not a legal expert, but just in terms of some of the discussions that have been held more generally, that if our amendment were voted down, my understanding is that I don't know if we could necessarily bring it back at further consideration stage. My understanding is that amendments at further, and, and it's not in terms of what it would be intended to do by way of revision and what have you, but my understanding is that amendments at further consideration stage can't reverse or overturn a decision that was taken at an earlier stage in the process. So essentially, if the amendment was moved, um, and, and, and this is all obviously very hypothetical, but if it was moved and was voted down, my understanding is that the Assembly has taken the decision that it does not want that amendment, and it then couldn't overturn that decision at further consideration stage, if that makes sense. Um, but as I said, we, we're, we're more than happy to have discussions with the Minister in, in terms of kind of the, the suggestions that have been made by the committee in relation to that, if, if that's helpful. Um, I appreciate where members are coming from in, in terms of not having had the opportunity to consider the detail of the provision. As you say, it is very much about trying to embellish upon what is, to give effect to the attempt in the, the committee provision but to embellish upon that in terms of trying to provide us with as much flexibility and scope as possible in terms of bringing forward the detail of the regulations. And as you say, our concern would be, and as members rightly point out, uh, the committee's amendment is very brief. It's very concise, very succinct. Our concern is that we wouldn't have enough scope within that to do all that we need to do once we get into the, the details of it. And as I say, one of the examples that we've been made aware of is in relation to making provision around colleges. As I say, the, the committee amendment at, at the moment is making reference to schools. If the committee amendment were to stand and there weren't any adjustment to that, we wouldn't be able to make provision in relation to colleges. So it, it's that type of thing that we're trying to provide for. We're, we're setting out information in relation to who would be the designated, per, who would be the, the person sharing the information, who would be the person receiving the information, what's deemed to be a school, what's deemed to be a college, what's deemed to be a pupil, um, and also other um, powers more generally that will allow us to do, you know, obviously we've, we've tried to, to cover as much as we can in terms of the, um, the, the scope of that provision, but there's also a general provision in there that would allow us to do such other things as are, as are necessary for the purposes of bringing this forward. So the amendment is very much intended to try and be as comprehensive and robust as possible to give us as much scope as we can in terms of fleshing out the detail of how Operation Encompass will operate and as I say it was never our intention to disrespect the committee. We hadn't brought this forward purely on the basis that we were of the view that it wouldn't be within scope. As, as the chair has pointed out obviously that is going to be a matter for the, the speaker to decide on. Um, just, just on a procedural point, if the department's amendment is voted down then the assembly will vote on the committee amendment and approve it so therefore it can come back at further consideration stage. It's a, yeah, you know, that that's the purpose of the further consideration stage, um, and at that point, then the department can again bring forward this amendment to, to provide the further clarity. And as you said, um, it wasn't embellish. I can't remember the exact turn of phrase that you you used, but give it the meaning and the aim that is desired. Um, okay. Should it be the committee's preference? We're obviously more than happy to have that discussion with the minister. Should there be a desire to move the committee amendment at committee stage and for our amendment to be brought at further consideration stage, if that is deemed to be procedurally more appropriate? Well, I suppose the committee amendment is in. It's, it's being moved. 
you know, we're, we're not, not moving it in that respect. It's, it's your call as a department as to whether or not you're going to move your own amendment. Um, we'll have to decide uh, as members whether we're going to vote it down um, for a whole variety of reasons, but then we're voting for our own amendment. And you know, the amendment that the committee is putting in is to give the department power for the regulations, and it's in those regulations that you can then bring forward all of this detail. So that, that's... I think the problem that members have to face, there's there's nothing in our amendment, um, as I see it, that presents a problem. Um, I take the point around schools and colleges, but I'm almost, again, I'm not advising the Assembly from a legal point of view, but you know, the Assembly passes the committee amendment. I don't see why it then couldn't pass this at further consideration stage in terms of what the department has done, if we think that that's actually the best vehicle for it. Members mightn't think that. Um, Sinead, your, your hand is up. Uh, is that to come in at this point? Yeah. Yes, Chair. Um, you're saying that our committee has moved already. Is, is that technically true? You know, I know we've submitted, but is it not on, at that point at which in the Assembly floor you stand up as Chair to actually move it? Is that the point when it's technically moved? From a procedural point of view, I, I need to move the amendment, but at the committee has agreed the committee amendments. They're in, in the chairman's name, so therefore they're all being moved. By me, what we would need to do now is, are, as a committee, are we not going to move it? That, that would be a, another... The decision has been taken that all of these amendments are being moved. It would be now, in light of the minister's amendment, that the committee would need to agree for me not to move it. Yeah, sorry, Paul Frey. Yeah, if Shani is finished... I don't want to step in. Uh, so, so here's the danger. We have spent months producing our report that we will give to the floor of that assembly, and it will count for nothing if we do not do what it says on the on the tin on that report. We have we have we have spent a long time putting these. Now, I'm not precious about amendment or a committee amendment or a minister's amendment. I'm not. But every every point that Fronick argued there and made. Uh, around uh, you know the the detail and, and and putting the detail in on colleges and further education and setting out the parameters for regulation, that can all be done at further consideration stage. All be done, and I'm not 100 percent sure, chair, about whether you can bring an, an amendment that has been voted down on the floor of the assembly verbatim again. You might have to tweak it technically, and it might be, but but if you vote something down in word. I'm not sure you can bring it back at further consideration stage, even if it's to strengthen another amendment that has been passed. I would worry about that, and I don't know that the Department of Justice should take that chance. They're putting members of this committee in a very bad position because we may well have to vote down something that we actually want to see. I'm not sure yet because I haven't had time to look at it, but that would be horrendous, a horrendous position to place members in. Yeah, but even if you look, members, at the, the, the department's amendment, 24B3, regulations under this section may contain provision. You know, we've empowered through our amendment the regulations to do that. So, you know, yeah, anyway, I think we've exhausted in terms of the, the, this issue. Procedurally, the, the speaker will, will decide if the department's amendment is going to be admissible, as it will decide if ours is admissible. Advice I'm getting is ours more is more likely than the department's, but listen, that's that's up to the speaker now at this stage. So some of this debate, like we've had for months now, could be at at naught. Rachel, just a small point. Um, I mean, if there's there's obviously if there'd be a pointed issue about the colleges there, if ours passes, there's nothing to stop us bringing a, a technical amendment back at further consideration stage. I'm sure it would have been would have been more beneficial for the department to do that tidying up if there was an issue with ours, but. Um, I mean, there's nothing to stop us adding in colleges and and making reference to what a pupil is and what a student is, if that's the issue with, with ours. Yeah. We, we still can do that. That's certainly my understanding of how the procedures work. So, But you know, I, I'm, I am more amenable to, to what Linda suggested, that there's a point here where, as a committee, we've put down an amendment. That's the committee's amendment that's there. Um, and that can be refined at further consideration stage. You know, 
for uh, the committee can't take a view as to the the competence and, and effectiveness of the minister's amendment because of the way in which the department decided to handle this issue. Um, so we can't reach a view on the minister's amendment, um, but we know what our amendment's trying to do, and it can then be finessed at the further consideration stage, which is the normal process. That's the normal process for legislation. What the minister's doing is up to the minister to do in terms of what they have decided, but that's the way we're trying to do this is the normal way that things are usually done. So the committee is still for us to move, me to move then this amendment. Obviously, when it comes to the minister's amendment, we can ask the minister not to move it um, and to bring forward a refining amendment at further consideration stage. If the minister doesn't do that, we now have the legislative text if we wish to use it and incorporate that into a further consideration stage amendment uh, and that will address these issues um, but obviously members should both amendments be selected then we need to know as MLAs what we're doing there's probably conversations that will need to happen in advance of Tuesday between the parties around that. I certainly lean towards the suggestion that we have to, to work together as a committee on this and um, I'm reluctant to vote for the Minister's Amendment without having at any time to interrogate it whatsoever. Um, and that would lead me to the view of voting it down and then voting for the Committee Amendment and then refining it at further consideration stage. That's where I would be in terms of the travel of direction. Okay, members, any other comments? Members, no? Okay, let's... We'll get Operation Encompass <laughs> sorted out. The last thing is going to be achieved. It should be done. There's been more conversation around Operation Encompass than the that. Unbelievable. <laughs> um, guidance on data collection. The Minister's in agreement with the committee. There you go. Um, so that's good to, good to know. Training. So the Minister doesn't support the, the committee's amendment relating to the provision of training and is bringing forward an alternative amendment to place the duty for training on the police and the PPS for their staff rather than the department. The text of the Minister's amendment um, has been provided. It provides for the PSNI and the PPS to provide such train, training as they consider appropriate for their personnel and the department to do likewise for staff within the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service. The Department Amendment members does not cover subsections 2 to 4 of the Committee Amendment, um, which provides for annual training, mandatory training for all those involved in the disposal of domestic abuse cases, in policing and criminal justice agencies, and reporting on the uptake of training by each relevant organisation at the end of each year. The Minister has highlighted that the Interpretation Act uh, 1954 requires that where there is a duty in legislation, that it shall be performed from time to time. She's also included some of the intent of the reporting requirement provided by subsection 4 of the committee amendment and her alternative amendment covering the reporting of the offence, um, which will be, will be discussed next. So subsections 1 and 2 of the minister's amendment better reflects the intention of subsection 1 of the committee uh, amendment. Um, so, members, if there's... Any information that you're needing from Veronica, you're happy to take a view then um, in terms of what it should do. So, uh, let, me, let me make a recommendation on this one, maybe again, that the committee would go with the committee amendment and the text of subsection 1 could then be improved at further consideration stage, either by the department or by the committee, so that we, we stick with our amendment and if we want to refine it, we can refine it. Yeah. It doesn't cover the mandatory and the annual, and that's my, I may again said it, whatever my personal view is on that, the committee reached a position, and I, I'm going to stick with the committee position on that. Yeah, the chair, the, the, it's the principle, same principle as the conversation we've just had. We've produced a report. The report is what guides the assembly, members who don't have the privilege of sitting in this committee. So we have, we have, we have spent a long time deliberating and getting to a position, a compromise position. Uh, a collegiate position. There should be no way that the department or any minister or anybody else for that matter should try and knock that asunder. And uh, the principle stands, we haven't the time as a committee to get a collegiate view on an amendment. So why, why should we have to be pressurised within days of this coming to the floor? Okay. 
people are happy then, we'll go with our own committee amendment and then if needs be we can look at it at further consideration. In independent oversight, the Minister um, doesn't support the committee amendment providing for independent oversight. While she agrees that the need for oversight and scrutiny of how the offence operates, she believes it's an important to consider both current and future oversight functions and financial resource implications. She considers the committee amendment is akin to a domestic abuse commissioner in uh, all uh, but name. So obviously, members, that's the minister's position. I don't agree with it. Um, but listen, that's again a prerogative of the minister to, to give her reasons. I'll be outlining on behalf of the committee what it is trying to do and why the committee has supported it. If we'd have wanted a domestic abuse commissioner, we would have called it a domestic abuse commissioner and tried to give it the powers. But you know, again, we're operating within the scope of the bill and we're trying to do something that provides that level of oversight. But listen, that's the minister's outlined her position. Um, Report on the operation of the Act. So, the Minister agrees with the Committee on the need for information to be provided in relation to the operation of the offence, but intends to bring forward an alternative amendment to the Committee's amendment relating to reporting on the operation of the Act to remove the ongoing duty on the Department to report uh, which she considers inappropriate uh, once the new offence is fully bedded in. Text of the Minister's amendment has been provided. Um, it provides for a reporting period of not less than two years and not more than three years, beginning with the day in which this part comes into operation, as determined by the Department of Justice. So, having looked at it, the Minister's amendment broadly covers the Committee's int intention. It appears to cover the elements listed in the Committee amendment, um, whilst trying to better capture how data is reported and tracked. And the key difference, as I see it, um, relates to the obligation of the Department no more than two years after commencement, and then at intervals of not more than three years provided for by the committee. Um, there's also some other differences. The committee amendment asks for the average length of time, that's in 2C, and the department amendment covers the typical length of time. I'm not sure the difference between average, typical. Um, in addition, the reference in 3 in the committee amendment on collecting distinct statistics is not present in the department's amendment. Rachel? Thanks, Chair. Just want to clarify on this again, because we've only seen it. Um, is this the minister and the department saying that they will prepare one report? Because that's my reading of it, again, very briefly. But if this is for the department to prepare one report after three years of embedding in the offence, and that's it. I don't think that's um, what certainly what we had intended, which is reporting, continuous reporting, longer term reporting. Um, so I'm not too sure. Just uh, maybe we could get some clarity on that, as if that's an ongoing report or a one report. Okay. So, Dr. Holland, do you want to just? Clarify for us that that issue. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, it would be one report, as, as you notice, removing the the ongoing requirement. And I think the concern there is in relation to you know that that type of continuous ongoing reporting in relation to offences isn't done for any other offence. Um, you know the precedent that that would set going forward. Um, information and data and and the the key elements that are, are referred to in the reporting provision um, would continue to be provided in terms of kind of the annual statistics and what have you that organisations would um, currently be looking at providing on, on in the context of um, information that the, the department currently provides in relation to offences. It's um, the issue really is around that, that wider reporting element. Um, as I say, once an offence has bedded in, um, we don't consider that that longer term reporting should be um, provided for and would have concerns about the implications for that in terms of other offences being brought forward longer term and in terms of the, the resource implications in relation to that. Okay, thank you. Um, suppose members, the key point there is around the report aspect of it. You know, the, the arguments around being different other offences, that was an argument made around the independent oversight in the Minister's letter as well. So. Um, so, members, in, in, in terms of how the committee can proceed with with this, uh, again, 
we can, we can go forward with our amendment. Um, I do think, and we have it now, uh, some of the, the department's amendment in terms of how it more accurately collects data and tracks it, I think has merit. So that is something that the department can bring forward at further consideration stage. The problem, as I see it, with the department's amendment, core aim of the committee's amendment is this reporting aspect. And if the assembly didn't pass that um, and went for the minister's amendment, then you wouldn't be able to put that in at further consideration stage because that's going to not be the core aim, potentially, as I think is a risk. Linda, were you wanting to come in there? Are you um, no. I th Okay, I suppose it comes back to the, the issues that we have with all of the other ones. It's, it's that inability to yep. fully scrutinise and then that concern around whether the committee's aims are going to be met by the, by the, the Minister's amendments. And that's not to say that there's anything wrong with the Minister's amendments. They may well be actually, and we've, we've said this even around the, the Operation Encompass one to be fair, they may well be better than the committee's, but we don't know. And you know, I can see sensible reasons and merit why, why you know, the, the department have potentially, for example, looked at the reporting period and said not less than two, not more than three, is actually more doable, more practical, will give will give us better information. And so so I think that and, and I mean Veronica can speak for the department, I'm sure she doesn't even speak for her, but so I, I can see merit in, in things like that. And it would jump out at you, make you think. But that's what the purpose of it was. But I just don't think we've had enough time to to come to a committee position. And back to the same point, I don't want us to move forward not as a committee, you know, in relation to these amendments. Because if we're going to go down that road, are we saying that all of the amendments, that the more or less that's what we're saying at this stage, if we're, if we're going to go for what the minister's asking us to do? That all of the committee's amendments were a waste of time. They're wrong. They weren't um, the best vehicle. And what was all of that not doing? And that's I'm, I'm a bit concerned about that. You know, have to say. That's yeah. Okay. So our members content that when it comes to this one that we stick with the committee amendment. It'll yeah. be moved. Um, this one again, I'm assuming the minister's amendment will come first. So there's a an issue there of we're going to have to dispose of the minister's amendment and then go for the committee amendment. Um, members will note the marshal list has just been published. Yep. So the issue around um, the issue around the operation encompasses a, actually a, a real one now because it has been selected the ministers and the committees. Um, so both of those are going to be on the on the. <laughs> and, and let me emphasise, chair. There is real grave risk here by the department in doing what they've done. They've waited too long to, to engage with the committee and they've went too soon with regards to stages of legislation. Yeah. Okay, well listen, I, I'm, I'm of the view that we, we stick together um, in terms of the committee's amendment on this. The reporting aspect of it, key problem with the department is it removes the... Uh, the the reporting criteria that we've put in, uh, and that, that to me is, is not in line with what the committee wanted to do, so therefore the committee um, needs to go with the committee amendment on that one, and then at further consideration stage, the department can bring forward amendment uh, to tidy up on that one. Uh, are, are members content then with that? Okay. Uh, Veronica, can I thank you very much for, for joining with us, um, as always, your time's Appreciate it for the committee. Sorry. All right, thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Chair, just um, just on the the minister had brought another amendment, one that's not appearing on this letter, dated the first, but had brought and, and now says on the marshal list on clause nine, which I find quite surprising, and given that I had intended and published my amendments on Clause 9 on Monday. And the day after the department, or the Clause 9 amendment from the minister appears, which was my, intent, my understanding from this committee's lengthy deliberations on Clause 9, that 
There was no intention of moving any amendments on Clause 9 coming from the Minister of the Department. So I'm just wondering what changed between the letter dated the 1st of November, my submission of amendments on Clause 9 on Monday the 2nd, which led to the submission of Clause 9 amendments on Tuesday the 3rd, and that doesn't appear in this letter, because the committee has not had time to scrutinise the Minister's amendments on Clause 9 which are not the same as mine. Something that no doubt I will be raising on Tuesday, but I think it would be good just in the spirit of this conversation that we've had um, on the department having a number of amendments that we didn't get to see or have time to deliberate, that actually this letter is not the full picture. Not sure, Veronica, if you're able to in the committee on that. Chair, as far as I'm aware, there should have been separate letters sent to the committee in relation to that provision. And I suppose, in looking, we, we had it prepared before Rachel's amendment came in. Um, I suppose what I, I would clarify that is that this isn't in reaction to the amendment as such that has been tabled by um, Rachel. It was on further considering the issues that Rachel, is, as well as some of the things that Paul had um, touched upon, um, you know, we further looked at the provisions in, in looking at um, the reasonable person um, amendment in relation to that and, and looking at it, I suppose, in the round in the context of what the safeguards and checks are within the domestic abuse offence itself, the further safeguards that there are in relation to the um, additional element of the aggravator should both have a reasonable person aspect, the offence itself has a reasonable person um, element to that. There has to have been abusive behaviour. This additional child aggravator also has a reasonable person aspect. Some of our earlier concerns had been in relation to um, the scope of it potentially being um, too broad. On looking at that again, following the, the discussions that we'd had with the committee, um, as I say, I think that, that combination of those safeguards in both the offence element and also in the, the aggravator element, um, you know, our, our view is now that um, you know, that, that shouldn't be an issue. And as I say, it was in, in part to address the concerns that have been raised by the committee at the, the earlier stage. Um, so these amendments have been prepared um, earlier than, you know, they have been prepared earlier than when they were tabled, if that makes sense. So the, the amendment wasn't brought forward just in response to, um, to Rachel's amendment, rather it was to reflect um, the earlier deliberations with the committee and having looked at the provisions again and, and given the concerns that have been raised in relation to this. Okay, Rachel. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Veronica, for that. Um, I'm just wondering then, why was the decision... Sorry, just the last conversation that we had where there was an admittance on the behalf of the department that the, the discussion that we'd had, and notably myself and Paul, on this provision... And we'd gone at, as you know, we'd gone at it for a number of, of sessions on this in great detail. Um, and that there was no need for this. It was fine. It was covered. There was, it, we came back then with further information that actually the information that the committee had been given was wrong. Clarified that we still didn't need it. And the committee agrees to its report. There's no indication from the minister of the department that they would be moving anything like this. I certainly haven't had sight of any letter regarding Clause 9. Um, I'm not too sure if, if the chair, deputy chair, have at all, but um, I'm seeing shaking heads, so I, I certainly haven't seen it. And it, it would have been, it, even if the committee hadn't seen it, the fact that myself and Paul Frey have continuously raised this, it could have been something that was discussed. So it... I, I'm wondering when, when the decision was taken to table an amendment, also the fact that this amendment is actually different than mine, it also adds in more restrictions rather than less um, in terms of the residence um, aspect of it. And the committee has been given absolutely no information on this at all from the Minister of the Department in the letter dated the 1st of November. So if the, if the amendment had been written and decided upon by the department before the first and not in reaction to an amendment that I had made very clear that I was bringing, even though we had been told that it made no substantial difference to the legislation and no safeguards were there, when was that, when was that particular amendment drafted and why did we not get any information on this? 
on the letter of the 1st of November, or if it had been realised that we didn't get any information on the 1st of November, are we getting it now only because I raised it on the 5th? The letter in relation to that was the letter that is setting out information in relation to that clause 9 was also dealing with a follow up to information that the committee had sought at one of their earlier sessions in relation to the parental responsibility exclusion. So there are two elements to that letter. It was drafted before the minister's letter. Um, and I, I can only apologise if that hasn't reached the committee, but it was done at a at an earlier date and that earlier letter covers, as I say, the committee at one of their earlier sessions had said they want further information in relation to the parental responsibility exclusion ahead of taking a decision in relation to that. It was felt that at the, the session that that had last been discussed at, that there hadn't been sufficient time. So there's a letter covering that and in that letter we were also making reference to the fact that further consideration had been given to the issues that had been raised in relation to this. So those two elements were dealt with in the one letter that, as I say, was prepared ahead of the one that um, has been sent by the, the Minister. I'm, I'm not sure why the, the committee haven't received that, and certainly that can be looked into. Apologies in, in, in terms of the committee not, not having that information, but the, the letter was prepared ahead of the ministerial one. Thanks, Chair. Um, I would, I'm just wondering when we requested further information on parental alienation from the Department, because we squared that circle off in the committee report? It wasn't in relation to parental alienation it was in relation to the reduction in the parental responsibility exclusion in one of the the earlier sessions i, I can't remember the, the date of it reference was made in the minutes of the proceedings that the committee wanted further information to allow it to consider it's it's the issue around um, the child protection provisions being put in the child cruelty offense and then the proposal that the parental responsibility exclusion the age for that would be reduced from under 18 to under 16. At one of the sessions, the committee had indicated they wanted further information in relation to that to allow them to make a, a, a more informed position in relation to that particular amendment. Which is close. So it, it's not parental response. It's not sorry, parental alienation. It's a parental responsibility exclusion. Okay, apologies. Sorry, I'm I'm deaf in my left ear, so apologies that if I picked you up wrong just on that one. Um, I'm did. Do, have we received any letter regarding clauses 11 and 17 then with regard to parental responsibility and the changing the child protection in legislation? No, we didn't. Okay. Clauses 11, clause 11 and 13. And Sorry, 13. Those amendments are down. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Sorry, Rachel has picked up something on clause yeah. 9. Oh, it is 11 and 17. Sorry. No. We no. haven't seen any letter. We'll double check our records, but okay. I'm not aware of any letter coming in. Chair, if I request that, that information is sent to committee members, sort of as soon as, as soon as possible, given that consideration stage is in less than a week, and I, Please yeah, follow that up at our end. thank you, appreciate that. Um, I would also I suppose if there's any follow-up information in terms of the. Um, the wording of the Minister's Amendment on Clause 9 and the um, why, why it's worded like that. Why is it not the direct copy of Scotland? Um, and why is there um, restrictions put on it in terms of residence about where the child must live? Um, I could get into another conversation about that. that the, the slightly different wording will reflect the drafts person's individual style. Um, and in terms of the residence condition about having to live with one or other of the individuals, that provision is also in the Scottish provision, so it was reflecting um, that aspect. Okay. Um, Chair, fairly obviously, I will not be supporting the Minister's amendment on Tuesday, um, and I will be attempting to move my own. So, yeah, just, it. Chair, on that, on the point around clause nine, and again, the the department and the minister in front may well have been trying to be helpful in this regard, but there had, there was no indication throughout. Whenever we were uh, raising this issue, time and time again, and we spent a lot of time, mm -hmm. and we held up the committee a lot on this issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and I certainly gave the time, uh, the, the the commitment at the time that I was content with regards to the. Uh, changes in the amendments in the. Andrea, yep. Now again, this might be good. I, I but I don't know, and I haven't had the time to digest this. And the committee 
surely will not have the time to digest it. So we'll begin in here on the floor of the Assembly as individual MLAs. And again, whilst we've been surprised with regards to these new amendments, the Department's just going to have to wait to see what we do. Can I provide some clarification in relation to the EFM point? Yes, please, Dr Holland. Um, that provision has been, we obviously as part of the earlier discussions have given a, an assurance to the committee that an amendment will be made to the expanded and financial memorandum to deal with the awareness of the child. When we look at the text of the expanded memorandum, it makes explicitly clear in relation to it, it's not part of the bill and it's only for information. We were therefore concerned in terms of kind of the robustness around being able to address that point for the committee in, in terms of it being in the expanded memorandum as opposed to on the face of the bill. So it's for that reason that we've included that provision in the face of the bill rather than including it within the expanded memorandum. Yep, which is exactly what Paul Frew and others had asked for and was told not needed. It was in the EFM and that's why the committee then agreed with the department's position on it and now we're being told it needs to be in primary legislation, despite repeatedly the department saying, no guys, don't worry about this, not necessary, but we can change it in the EFL. I would, Chair, just, I would certainly welcome if there is um, requests going to the Minister to remove or not move her uh, amendments for other things, that, that also applies to Clause 9. I would certainly welcome the committee's support on my own amendment, um, of course, um, and we'll be making the case for that on Tuesday. And if there are specific wording issues, such as the style of the amendment drafter that need to go in, there is always further consideration stage to strengthen the legislation by the Minister. Yeah, and I just echo my point that the Department have been too late to come to, with the, to these conclusions with this committee and they've went too early with regards to the procedures of legislation. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, Dr Holland, thank you. I know um, you're trying to head this up as a civil servant in the department and some of this frustration is for the minister and not for you to take, so uh, I don't wish to... You've been nothing but helpful to the committee in, in that respect and trying to provide answers to us, but there is definitely a major problem with the department has went about its business and the tactics that it's... Our apologies in, in terms of we, we understood that we were being helpful by bringing it forward at consideration stage as opposed to leaving it to further consideration stage. The view of the committee is quite clearly that, that some of these should have been left to further consideration stage. As I say, we were bringing them forward at this stage with you to to being helpful and, and giving us already an indication of that at this point in the process as we could. I don't know the answer to this, but maybe it is the case that you may not be able to bring the Minister's Amendment, Amendment 5, Clause 9, at further consideration stage, that it needs to be done at consideration stage. And that's probably the dilemma that the Department faces. Um, I think for some of the, the aspects, are, they're, and it's obviously something we, we would want to be seeking legal advice on, but I think there is potentially, in some of the differences between the amendments, if an aspect is, is, is brought forward and approved by the House at consideration stage, it therefore wouldn't be possible for us to bring forward an element of further consideration stage that would essentially be deemed to reverse that benefit, is, as I said, my, my understanding in, in relation to some of the amendments. So I, I'm not sure that we actually, where the committee has approved something um, and we want to make a change that was then seen to overturn the decision that already had been taken by the Assembly, um, whether or not there may be some difficulties there. Okay, Dr. Holt, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Okay, members. I've asked for Stephanie to come down to give us a little bit more assurance on some of the decisions that were taken. So I'm going to go into closed session now in order for Stephanie to deal with some questions for us. So um, we'll go into closed session and then come back out into public for the rest of the business. Okay, members. Um, item seven then on the agenda, the carriage of explosives regulations. 
151-163, the Department is proposing a stat rule to correct um, Northern Ireland legislation that would otherwise cease to function properly at the end of the EU exit transition period in relation to the carriage of explosives. The proposed rule ensures that the carriage of explosive regulation 2010 continues to operate as before by ensuring that the regulatory framework for the carriage of Class 1 goods remain in place. The 2010 regulations implemented the EU's dangerous goods directive relating to Class 1 goods, including international carriage by road and rail. The directive is not listed within Annex 2 to the Northern Ireland Protocol and so will not extend to Northern Ireland at the end of the transition period. Instead, the UK is committed to implementing the requirements of pre-existing European agreements and conventions that were implemented within the Dangerous Goods Directive. The rule will not change the requirement for those involved in the carriage of explosives by road and rail within Northern Ireland. <clears throat> the Department has indicated that no consultation has taken place as it is not a requirement of, EU, uh, of the EU Withdrawal Act 2018. Uh, the rule is subject to draft affirmative resolution procedure and it comes into operation the day it is affirmed by the Assembly. The Department aims to have these provisions in place at the end of the transition period. So it's whether members have any further information on this. Gemma Dolan. Yeah, thanks Chair. Um, I am content, but I just want clarity on one point. Will this SR ensure continued alignment with all regulations in relation to the carriage of dangerous goods or will there be any gaps? Okay, um, I'll hold that for you and bring in Sinead. Yeah, Chair, just for your information, uh, you please know I did have queries on this which I raised with the clerk and the department did bring me back answers which I'm satisfied with. It was about whether it would um, have effect on north-south crossing or I, I was just curious to know whether oxygen tanks would come under um, this, but it doesn't. I think it's Category 2, but thank you. Let me just check. Um, Christine, do you, are you able to advise Jen on that, or is that something we need to go back to the department on? We need to go back to the department. Okay. Well, if you're happy, Gemma, we'll go back to the department to get clarity on that. Yeah. Okay. Well, listen, we'll, we'll go back to the department and get clarity on that, and then we can pick it up again. Item 8, um, Counter-Terrorism Bill, just a, an update. Um, at our meeting on the 15th of October, the committee considered correspondence from the Minister of Justice advising that she had received a request from the UK Government to bring forward an LCM uh, to oper operationalise the provisions within the Counter-Terrorism Bill, uh, but had concluded, given differing views of the matter, there was insufficient support for either this uh, limited LCM or a full LCM. She's therefore written to the UK Government indicating it wouldn't be possible to secure uh, legislative consent from the executive for the relevant provisions within the bill. Um, the committee did agree then to write to the Minister of Justice seeking confirmation that she would lay out a memorandum um, before the Assembly explaining why the LCM was not being sought in accordance with the relevant standing order. We also wrote then to the Parliament, Parliamentar Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Justice, Chris Philp, um, for clarification on how the UK Government was then going to take this matter uh, forward in the absence of an LCM and the committee has received pr procedural advice in respect of the standing order 42 and the LCMs at our meeting on the 22nd. The Minister laid the memorandum in the Assembly on the 23rd of October and that can be found in the meeting pack. A response from the Parliamentary Under Secretary for the State of Justice has not yet been received and uh, that is being pursued to try and get a response. So members can note the memorandum um, and uh, the position in terms of the response from Mr Philp MP. When we get it, then we can pick the issue up again. If members are prepared to note. Number nine, the department has written advising that the, at the minister's request, the presiding coroner, Mr Justice Huddleston, has been appointed um, coroner Patrick uh, McGurgan to the chair of a working group that will explore implications for the justice system in Northern Ireland of commencing section 49.1 of the Coroners and Justice Act 09. Uh, this provision would amend section 13 of the Coroners Act of 1959 uh, which would allow a coroner to hold an inquest into a death abroad where the bo body has been repatriated and is lying in Northern Ireland. Coroners in England and Wales, Scotland and Ireland already have jurisdiction to investigate the death occurring abroad. 
Um, so the working group will provide recommendations to the Minister on practical matters required to ensure the effectiveness of an investigation into a death abroad uh, by the end of January next year, and the committee then will be updated on the Minister's decision regarding the commencement uh, of Section 49.1 once she's considered the findings of that working group. So members, that information is there to note, unless there's any further clarity needed, we will duly note it. Item 10, um, the Department has written advising of its intention to undertake an eight-week public consultation on the defence of consent to serious harm for sexual gratification, which is commonly known as the rough sex defence, and has provided a copy of the draft consultation document, which it has worked with an expert reference group to develop. The consultation focuses on the need to, or otherwise, to legislate on this discrete issue. So, members, it's there to note that the consultation um, will take place, and we'll obviously pick the issue up in due course. Okay. Ten. Great. Correspondence. There's 13 items um, of correspondence in the, in the meeting pack, one in the table pack. I'll just highlight a couple of them. Um, there's a response from the Minister uh, regarding the introduction of legislation equivalent to Helen's Law following the motion that was passed um, by the Assembly on the 28th of September. The Minister has asked officials to engage with relevant stakeholders, including families, on the most appropriate approach uh, for Northern Ireland, and she will report the outcome of this work to the committee by the end of the year. Um, another item then is uh, the response from the Department to the committee's request for further information on estimated costs in respect of the proposed judicial pension reforms and the response to the McLeod judgment and the rationale for an eight-week consultation period and a response from uh, DOF on whether there is collective approach across the public sector to the judgment and then the plans for a remedy. The Department of Justice has outlined the position regarding estimated cost uh, that, uh, and in respect of the consultation period, cites the Stormont House Agreement uh, that determined the maximum time for consultations could be reduced from 12 weeks to 8 weeks. <coughs> Excuse me. The Department of Finance has indicated um, that it has devolved responsibility for public service pensions policy and a collective approach has been discussed and progressed at its collective consultation working group, uh, which is the recognised forum for consultation on public service pension policy, and where each of the devolved schemes is represented. So, there for noting, um, in terms of that information. Uh, one other item then, the Department regarding uh, what directions has been given to the PSNI in respect of enforcing COVID-19 regs and whether these can be resourced and are deliverable. The Department advised, given the operational independence of the police, the Minister has not given any direction to the PSNI regarding enforcement of COVID-19 regs. The Department has stated that other statutory organisations, such as councils, also have responsibilities for compliance and enforcement, and a strategic enforcement group has been set up by the Executive, and that includes DOJ officials. Uh, it also confirms that the PSNI engage, explain and encourage approach is still in place and it will only enforce where necessary. So again, members, it's there for noting unless there's further information that's required. Um, so members, if you're content, we'll action the other items of correspondence as set out in the cover sheet. Great. I don't have any other business. Is there any other business members have? If not, then our next meeting will be uh, today week, and that's in the Senate chamber. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.